Right, members, will the House come to order? Before we proceed, I'd like to make mention that we have uh, 12 amendments that we uh, need to uh, consider and vote on. Uh, we are asking that it will be, be limited to 10 minutes debate for each amendment, and then the question will be called for a vote. So with that, uh, is there an amendment to be presented? Uh, Mr. Speaker? Yes, Representative Oshiro. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. I will uh, not uh, accede to that uh, earlier announcement, but at this time I would like to offer a floor amendment number 18 for consideration by the body. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Have copies of the floor amendment been distributed to the members? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of floor amendment number 18 have been distributed. Thank you very much. Representative Mishiro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 18. Okay, thank you very much. Is there a second to the motion? Mr. Speaker, I'll second the motion. It has been moved and seconded for amendment number 18, discussion on this measure. Representative Oshiro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Floor Amendment number 18, footer 14-0232, uh, adds a severability clause. It's similar to what was in House Bill 6. The purpose of a severability clause, Mr. Speaker, or inseverability clause, should I say, is to have the effect that any part of this law or act is deemed unconstitutional, null, and void. The entire act goes away. Uh, it's based upon um, an inseverability, non-severability clause, uh, I believe in the state of uh, New York, where that was enacted several years ago. Uh, the purpose and intention of having a non-severability provision is this. It calls both sides to debate and discussion to realize that each are equally responsible to maintain the integrity of the whole act to all the parts, and that neither should use any, any, any deficiency of, of the part to be challenged and, and deemed unconstitutional or null and void. And in a way, it kind of puts uh, both parties into a, a stand-up, should I say, Mr. Speaker, so that the live and let live values that we have in Hawaii will be able to continue going forward and that we might never need to come back in to address this on a more substantive policy level. And that's been a place for several years now, so I put this before the body uh, just to ensure that we can get some kind of assurances from both sides of this debate and discussion that neither will have their fringe elements seek to defeat the intent of, the, of this law as we attempt to balance both equal protection and due process with fundamental religious freedoms and rights. Another provision in this is to make the rulemaking authority that we have been given to administer the licensing to the Department of Health all the full measure and benefit of public involvement, participation, and transparency under Chapter 91. Again, Mr. Speaker, the current language in the bill seems to give the carte blanche authority to do any and all things in the process of implementing this law. I think it's a dangerous precedent. It may also be an unlawful delegation of authority to an agency without guidance. And for that reason, I think it should go by the normal Chapter 91 procedures of public participation, inspection, or debate, discussion, and disclosure. I believe it also would run afoul, as currently drafted, of HRS 201M-2, the Small Business Impact Statement, which reads as follows. Prior to submitting proposed rules for adoption, amendment, or repeal under Section 91-3, the Hawaii Administrative Procedures Act, the agency shall determine whether the proposed rules affect small business, and if so, the availability and practicability of less restrictive alternatives that could be implemented. Mr. Speaker, the governor has the authority, and he has used it in the past in promulgating such rules as, I think, um, fishing regulations. So there is emergency rulemaking authority 
or emergency rulemaking authority regarding the State Historic Preservation Division, so that can be done. But the foundational law should not give any agency or department unfettered discretion to promulgate rules in effectuating the, the law. Number three, there is a divorce provision here that I believe others will speak to. I believe it's Section 10 that I believe unconstitutionally gives uh, out-of-state litigants uh, the ability to access our family courts and thereby annul or seek dissolution or even support orders through our family courts without having the requisite domiciliary requirements or residency requirements under current law. As a former family practitioner, Mr. Speaker, it was always impressed upon me that you needed to have both the rest and the property of, uh, and the parties available in the jurisdiction uh, which the family court sits. And finally, Mr. Speaker, an important element in, insofar as we are reflecting upon Connecticut State's law. And members need to understand that Connecticut State law is only of any support for the proposition of providing realistic support for the religious solemnizations or exemptions therein. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, to your right, may I yield my time, sir? Sure, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker Emeritus. And the reason why you, they has any of the authority or could have any of that is that in Connecticut, they have adopted a state's version of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And as I spoke before, that's an important com uh, component to have the state as a um, private cause of action, a policy established by law, of having the uh, Schubert balancing test uh, placed above all of its state agencies, administrating procedures, and their, their commission. When you have that conflict between religious freedoms and in the individual liberties, Connecticut has that provision on its books to its own Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And I think that insofar as we're looking at Connecticut's law, Mr. Speaker, it would be wise and prudent and consistent with the Connecticut law to also have that uh, in what we're looking at today. And that's the purpose of my amendment this, uh, this afternoon, Speaker. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the discussion on this item. Mr. Speaker? Yes, Representative Sharon. Thank you. In support? Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first, may I please have the words of the speaker from Wahiwa entered into the journal as if they were my own? So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, secondly, Mr. Speaker, um, I do have concerns about the section, and I did, in fact, mention this the night uh, that we voted out Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1 from the Joint Committees on Finance and Judiciary. Specifically, again, this bill is entitled to relating to equal rights. And when we talk about the divorce, uh, divorce proceedings, we are essentially allowing uh, couples now who are not uh, domiciled here in the state of Hawaii to obtain a divorce in this jurisdiction if the jurisdiction in which they live does not provide for same-sex marriage. Um, Mr. Speaker, again, if you understand divorce law, and I'm, I don't profound to be an expert. I actually have friends who have taught me over the past few days the problems. I've been consulting uh, with my, con my colleagues and some of my friends who, co who contacted me about this section. They have grave concerns about this section insofar that it does, in fact, violate current family court proceedings by allowing a divorce without providing for children of the marriage. It doesn't require the same jurisdictional requirements that it does for heterosexual couples. So, for example, a heterosexual couple that wants to obtain a divorce in the state of Hawaii would be required to have at least one of those parties domiciled in the state of Hawaii for six months. In this situation, both parties do not have to be domiciled in the state of Hawaii. That is not equal, Mr. Speaker. Moreover, it creates many problems. Why is it now the state of Hawaii's responsibility, our taxpayers' responsibility, to go after and obtain jurisdiction for our courts to obtain jurisdiction over two individuals who don't, in fact, live in our state? In addition, there's another problem with this section, Mr. Speaker. Let's assume that the, the same-sex couple is, in fact, separated, not legally, but physically separated. One is living in a state that does, in fact, have same-sex marriage, recognizes same-sex marriage, and one is in a state that doesn't recognize same-sex marriage. So does that now preclude forum shopping? So there continue to be many sections in this which are very problematic from a family law uh, perspective. And again, Mr. Speaker, I am not an expert, but I've been contacted by the experts, and they are the ones urging me to support these four amendments. 
uh, because they, we are, will create several problems under family law if we pass this bill as is. For those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I support the floor amendment. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. Uh, for the discussion, remember we have a 10, 10 minute limit. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition. These, let me make a number of points. These four amendments have not had public review, have not had a committee hearing. Number two, these amendments have been produced outside the normal process. The normal review by attorneys has not been, not been made because they have been dropped on our laps literally minutes ago. Number three, we have 29 amendments here, 29 floor amendments, perhaps more than ever before. Now, these 29 amendments have been dropped on us slowly, a couple at a time, a bunch at a time, strung out over days, and at the last moment. From my reading, some of these amendments which we have before us and some of these which we have just dealt with are identical or virtually identical to amendments we have considered on Wednesday. I mean, I have not compared them word for word, but in my very quick reading in the time I've had, it seems that there is some redundancy. So, what do we do? We have gotten some assurance that, in terms of the technical aspects of this bill, uh, we have a bill that is adequate and sound. Number two, we are not the last arbiters of this bill. This bill still has to go over to the Senate, and the Senate has at least one three-day weekend to look at these bills. I mean, these four amendments. Mr. Speaker, point of order. State your point. What the Senate does or doesn't do with this bill is not relevant. Show sure. order. Thank you, okay. Representative. Well, I'm just trying to speak about the process. Yes, Representative. But uh, remember the time limits. We have 29. Okay. Then the bill goes to the governor for further review and signature. Another legal check. So there are opportunities to perhaps improve the bill if these floor amendments are worthy. And we, right now, can only do what we can in the time we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Question. A question, a question has been called. Point of parliamentary question procedure. Point of parliamentary information that supersedes his motion. Point take of parliamentary your, procedure. Take your point. Mr. Speaker, where in the rules does it say we can only talk about 10 minutes? Where does it say we can only do 29 amendments? Because is, we've already done 18 of those. It's the rules the of the majority. The gentleman is talking about 29 amendments. There are not 29 Mr. amendments Speaker. to go. It's cooking the books.
All right, but the House come in order. Representative Psyche. Mr. Speaker, I call for the question. Question has been called. All those in favor. I, I second. All those in favor Mr. signify Speaker, by saying aye. Please. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Mr. Speaker, recess, please. Beg you, state your, your question again. Sorry, I just, according to House Rule 48, we need a vote if we're going to call for the question. Can we take a vote first, please? Okay, thank you very much. It has Speaker. been moved and seconded. All Mr. those Speaker. in favor of ceasing debate, or stopping debate, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Motion is passed. So we're back to the question now. Those are in favor of the amendment, number 18, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Motion failed. So we're up to 19. Representative Speaker, Quintero. point of parliamentary information that I asked for state, the last time. State your point. Mr. Speaker, I asked for what rule do we limit debate to? 48. Uh, rule 48. The floor, the floor leader said it was rule number one. We can't find anything at rule number 48, one. 48. 48. Rule number 48. What is 48, it 48, sir. It says what? Read 48. I've got it memorized. It will take some time for you to read 48. Right. Will the house come to order? And that includes the gallery. Thank you. All right, we want uh, Representative Ward. Mr. Speaker, point of information in that rule number 48, which I did read, thank you very much for the reference, says that calling for the question and the procedures thereof. My question to you, Mr. Speaker, was why do we limit our debate to 10 minutes? We have gone through five days, 55 hours okay. of hearings. Okay, it has What been is the stated? rush? You have had an opportunity to re review the ruling, and we shall continue now. I don't have a horse in the race, but he's got some amendments to make, which okay, the people yes, should be able we'll to hear. Okay, yes, then we'll go on to, the, uh, to, to amendment number 19, Thank Representative you. Oshiro. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Amendment number 19. Yeah. At this time, I'd like to uh, offer for uh, amendment to the Senate Bill House Draft 1, uh, Floor Amendment Number 19. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, has the, uh, has the copies been distributed? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of Floor Amendment Number 19 have been distributed. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Mishiro. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 19. Right there is second. Mr. Speaker, I'll second that motion. It has been moved and seconded for amendment number 19. Discussion, please. Uh, Representative Oshiro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, amendment number 19 is footer number 14-0235. Again, it adds a severability clause. And let me just add the important severability clause is basically to put a truce on both sides of this uh, contentious debate. It basically puts a notice on uh, both sides that uh, any of their fringe members of their organizations, if they were to file a lawsuit, and any portion of this act would be deemed illegal, void, or unconstitutional, the whole act would go away. It's been used in other states. I think uh, New York is one state. I believe it may, may, may have been on Vermont or one of the northeast states. But it has served this purpose so far that no, su no suits have been brought uh, challenging the provisions either for the uh, marital rights of same-sex couples, nor the protections afforded the religious organizations in both the solemnization rights and or the use of facilities uh, therein. Again, it makes the rulemaking subject to Chapter 91 of the Hawaii Administrative Procedures Act. Um, I've always thought that this, con this provision here con gives too much uh, discretion to the uh, Department of Health and its agency for the promulgation of rules. I consider it uh, maybe an unlawful delegation of authority. Uh, in, a, in a statute like this. The governor always has his emergency rulemaking authority for that effect, Mr. Speaker. So that's why you also see it here. It also de deletes the uh, divorce provisions. That's in, I think, section 10 of the uh, Senate bill. Uh, I believe the representative of Kapolei has mentioned why it, it may run afoul of certain, certain uh, current family court practice. But I'd also like to draw people's attention to the uh, expert witness testimony that came in uh, through the Minority Caucus's uh, information of briefing uh, several weeks ago. Professor Wardell, who is a distinguished professor of family law, both nationally and internationally, opined that that particular provision, waiving domiciliary requirements uh, to interstate, intrastate uh, mar marital, uh, marital relationships, may indeed be unconstitutional, primarily for a violation of due process protections of those parties who may not be of the rest or of the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, state of Hawaii and also the effectiveness or lack thereof of the parties who may be on, on the mainland. I think I also need to add, Mr. Speaker, that it would apply to jurisdictions or jurisdiction. So that means it could be of two states on the mainland or could also be foreign jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker. It could be a jurisdiction outside the United States. It could be in a foreign land. And those parties, too, would have access to our family courts for the annulment, divorce, and or alimo, uh, support um, orders that our family court might let out. Finally, Mr. Speaker, it adds a uh, provision here that clarifies the language uh, in the current draft of House Draft 1, which I believe is deficient in that the language regarding the protections from legal liability only seems to address, and I point to page six, lines five, shall be immune from any fine, comma, penalty, comma, injunction, comma, administrative proceeding, comma, or any other legal or administrative liability for the failure or refusal. Uh, that similar language is also contained in another section dealing with the facilities, and that is on page 13, where it states on uh, page 13, lines 19, a civil union, comma, shall be immune from any fine, comma, penalty, comma, injunction, comma, administrative proceeding, comma, or any other legal administrative liability uh, for, for failure or refusal. Um, what, it, what, what, I, what I believe it misses out, and I believe it's substantive in, in, in the legal uh, sense, is that it should say that shall not create any civil claim or cause of action or result in any state action um, to provide real protections uh, to these, these parties. I would also find that it's deficient and it does not cover uh, political subdivisions of the state, which would include the counties, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this law has no effect over the counties and their regulations. 
and it certainly doesn't have any reflection or effect upon commissions as is reflected in the Connecticut law where it has uh, commissions. I think that omission is, is significant in light of the fact that under the current laws of the state regarding public accommodations, the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission uh, may have jurisdiction over these matters. So for those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I, I ask that we consider these uh, exemptions, I mean, these, these amendments to the uh, current House draft. Thank you. Okay, Representative, thank you very much uh, for the discussion on Mr. this Speaker? item. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the amended language only and not the underlying bill. Please, uh, please Thank you, proceed. Mr. Speaker. You know, first of all, may I please have the words of the Speaker from Wahiwa entered into the journal as if they're my own? So ordered. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, you know, it is the very reason that this bill was rushed that these amendments are necessary. These amendments were forced to right the wrongs of the majority. So I take great umbrage to one of my colleagues saying that these amendments were not reviewed and were rushing these through. They didn't go through the proper process. These were all discussed in hearing, and we are trying to make a bad bill better, which is the reason for these amendments being offered, Mr. Speaker. For these reasons, I support the amended language. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, further discussion, uh, Representative Awano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the amendment, and I'd also ask that the words of the representative from Kapolei be entered into so the ordered. journal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Further discussion? Mr. Speaker. Yes, Representative. I rise in opposition to this floor amendment. State, state your opposition. This floor amendment is similar to ones that we considered and voted down on Wednesday evening. In particular, the problem with this floor amendment is that it once again would allow for whole-scale discrimination by any individual who claims a sincerely held religious belief. That discrimination is not limited just to same-gender marriages or ceremonies. It, is, it opens the door to any form of discrimination, whether it be on age, gender, ethnicity, or any other classification. Accordingly, I oppose this floor amendment, and I will call for the question in three minutes. Thank you. Okay, question has been called. Is there a second to it? Mr. Speaker? I'll second. All those in favor in stopping debate, signify by saying aye. Mr. Aye. Speaker, recess. Those Mr. Speaker, say nay. recess. Those opposed say nay. Motion is passed. Debate is ended. Okay, all those in favor of approving amendment number 19, signify by saying aye. Those opposed? <laughs> amendment 19 dies or fails. Okay, we're on. Mr. Speaker? Amendment number 20. Mr. Speaker, may I have a short recess, please? Yes, recess. Uh, thank you.
O.J. and Representative Ward and Marquez, please be seated. All right, will the House come to order, please? And Representative Marcus Oshiro. Okay, Mr. Speaker, I can hardly hear myself with all the uh, fantastic uh, public display of democracy going on outside. Yes, Mr. Speaker. But I believe I have another floor amendment, Mr. Speaker. Please proceed. Uh, clerk, has the uh, has amendment number 20 been circulated among with the members? Have copies been circulated? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Copies of floor amendment number 20 have been distributed. Thank you very much. Representative Marcus Oshiro. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to add and thank you for allowing me the privilege of speaking on my constituents' behalf as a full and, uh, full and free member of the House of Representatives. It's great to be in uh, democracy this afternoon. Uh, floor Amendment number 20 is footer number 14-0234. Uh, again, it adds a non several Representative uh, Marcus Oshiro, you need to make a motion first. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me uh, first make a motion to adopt uh, floor amendment number 20. Thank you. And is there a second? There's a second. Mr. It Mr. has been moved and seconded. <laughs> Representative Marcus Oshiro, please proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, floor amendment number 20 uh, adds a severability uh, provision, uh, which I think is very important in these types of measures. It also adds the uh, rulemaking uh, limitation to uh, Chapter 91, the Hawaii Administrative Procedures Act, the Department of Health. Uh, it de deletes the divorce proceedings, provisions uh, that I find so offensive and maybe unconstitutional. Uh, it inserts the Connecticut State's uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And since one of the, uh, one of our former congressmen now, our governor is here, you know, I need to mention that this Religious Freedom Restoration Act was approved by the United States Congress and Senate when back in 1993 was for the important, important purpose of reestablishing the uh, compelling interest test uh, articulated in the Schubert case uh, that was overridden uh, by the POD case, the Oregon case, the Oregon unemployment case. And then Congress had the wisdom and the wherewithal to almost unanimously uh, reenact the standard as far as federal courts go and federal agencies go on what the proper balancing uh, test was. And that's the Schubert standard, whereby there is a government uh, authority to issue regulations and rules of our people and practices, um, but it has to have a compelling purpose, and it has to be narrowly construed for that purpose when it runs up against a person's uh, individual freedom of religion under Article 1 of our constitutions, and that it cannot have a substantial burden upon the person's uh, freedom of religion. And I think that's an important component that needs to be put into this, into this bill to provide clear legislative authority to an enactment of this provision so that our courts will have the proper guidance and authority to balance out the competing interests of equal protection due process against First Amendment, freedom of religion, freedom from religion, freedom of speech, freedom of publication, freedom of assembly. It also adds the uh, exemptions for small business, and much ado has been said about it. But let, me, let me stay for the record, be very, very clear about it. It's for a limited period of time, three years. Applies to only small business, five or less. Five or less, small mom and pops. It deals with all the aspects of human creativity, of free speech, which is components of taking a photograph, writing a letter, singing a song, doing a poem, publicizing an announcement, or operating the, in the technological world of a website or a database, in wedding planning, or advertising, or posting of gifts or solicitations. All those things are covered in the area of speech, and that's why it's so important, Mr. Speaker. That's why it's so important. And if the instance arises, Mr. Speaker, that the couple cannot receive those services, they are not easily attainable, then the pendulum swings back to that couple against the religious, in, religious beliefs of that small business owner. But it provides at least a balancing test and an ability for the courts and for the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission to clearly look at the competing interests and values. 
And that's why I think it's so, so, so important. And again, Mr. Speaker, it deletes the... Um, but that's it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Representative. Is there any further discussion on this item? If not, then uh, Representative uh, Woolley, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In opposition? Please proceed. I just want to let the caucus know that I don't like the language of this bill. I just saw it for the first time just now. And I want to explain why. Um, I'm a mama bear, uh, one of the few mama bears in this caucus, actually. And there's something that mama bears do share, uh, even though we are all very different in our opinions. And during the testimony, uh, there was one mama bear in particular that I saw who actually changed her testimony. I think she and her husband may have been the only ones to change their testimony from opposition to comments. And okay. I asked her uh, if she could explain to me why. And she wrote me a letter. And I would like to share that with you. She gave it to me this morning. And she also provided me with a book. I'm writing you as a friend with as much aloha as I can send, and I know you'll hear me as a friend. I know you're up against a lot here. There's a typhoon going on in the Capitol right now. My hope is that this letter can be for you in this moment, and I have calm in the middle of the storm. I would like to share with you the pivotal moment for me this last week. On Halloween, I arrived at the Capitol near sundown and saw a man from a distance. His arm was in a sling, and he was walking down the sidewalk with a friend. As he walked past some let the people vote sign holders, he turned to his friend, and although I couldn't hear it, it was obvious from the deep sadness on his face he was saying something to the effect of, this contention is so wrong. When someone is in pain, it, it, is it not our nature as women to be compassionate, to reach out to them and try to help? I felt drawn to him and wanted to help him, to find out why there was such sadness in his eyes. I ran into him again later. I asked if he was okay and if he'd share with me what happened. He told me hesitantly that his arm had been broken in five places and that yes, this happened at the hands of people who didn't like what he had to say. And then he backed off, went to do something else. I stuck around, I, could, I couldn't move. I wanted to know more. I was far more than curious. I needed to know how this sort of thing could happen. A few minutes later, he came back to talk with me. Jessica, it was awful. His eye was still a painful, deep purple, his nose bent and broken. This soft-spoken, honest, intelligent young man had been pretty brutally beaten and badly injured for sharing his opinion in America, here in Hawaii, that week. Granted, this kind of thing happened among the blue shirts too. Just a few days earlier, I met a woman who had been rammed by a truck just for holding a picket sign, terrible. If I had felt the first stirrings of feelings for the other side on Monday at the rally here on Wednesday, it hit me, overwhelming compassion and understanding. I could not hold back the tears, and then we were both hugging and crying. I felt the same way, the exact same way as I would feel if he were my son. The outpouring of love was almost tangible, and the connection between us was the most powerful I've ever felt outside my family. I walked away from that experience a different person. How could I not? All right, Representative, I believe we have a time limit. I would like to submit these in uh, writing, if that's okay. And that's I... okay. So ordered, Representative. Okay, thank you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Yes, Representative. Thank you. Offer the question, but please permit the move on to make a rebuttal. question argument. has been called. We'll give the opportunity for the maker of the motion to please uh, speak and rebut uh, Representative Marcus Oshiro. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just to uh, clarify several other items on the record, uh, when I made the um, reference to our, a former congressperson uh, back in 1993, I was making my reference to none other than our illustrious and beloved uh, Governor uh, Abercrombie. Also right. with him at that time was also our much loved and be beloved and respected and adored uh, Senator Inouye. 
Also with him at that time was our much beloved, respected, and adored Senator Daniel K. Akaka. And of course, we all love, cherish, and adore, and think of many days, especially these past, recent past days, uh, Congresswoman Patsy T. Mink. I'm proud to say that all of the Hawaii delegation at that time saw the wisdom and necessity to bring balance back to the equation that was driven apart in our country through the Rehnquist Court's ruling in the POD case, the unemployment case, that they felt and understood that it was important to recognize government's authority to regulate any and all avenues of public policy, but it needs to stop and pause when it gets to the door of a personal freedom of religion, of practice and belief of people. And so they passed that law, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, to provide that balance. And that's why I'm here again, Mr. Speaker, on this floor again, Mr. Speaker, asking for this floor amendment. It's consistent with the Connecticut law that we referenced in this House Draft 1. I think it's necessary and appropriate to buttress whatever we try and do and offer protections in this draft. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Okay, Representative, thank you very much. Is there a second to the motion to uh, cease debate? Mr. Speaker, Representative, I second there that is motion. A second. It has been moved and seconded. Mr. So Speaker, all those in favor of, of stopping please? debate may uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion is passed, so we're going to the main, main motion, the, the amendment. Amendment number 20. Those in favor of amendment number 20 signify by saying aye. Those opposed say nay. Motion dies. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on uh, number 21 right now, uh, Representative Oshiro. Mr. Speaker, short recess, please. Recess. All right, members, will House come to order? Before I go on, I, I'm i sorry that I introduced the governor sooner, but Governor Abercrombie, my good friend, you please stand up here. And, uh, all right. All right. All right, good friends in the gallery, order. Order in the gallery. There is such a word us local people call all the time, respect. Always respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on uh, amendment number 21. 
Representative Marcus Rashiro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have a floor amendment to uh, offer. Floor amendment number 21. Okay, thank you very much. Clerk, has the, uh, has the copies been distributed? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of floor amendment number 21 have been distributed. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Marcus Rashiro, will you make a motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move for the adoption of floor amendment to number 21. Okay, is there a second to the motion? Second Representative to the motion. Speaker, say, okay, it has been moved and seconded. Representative Marcus Oshiro. Mr. Speaker, this is a uh, similar amendment to the prior floor amendments, but I want to just highlight what I'm trying to do here. Uh, first of all, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I believe that the current House Draft uh, 1 is deficient in that it, it seeks to provide protections for the uh, religious exemptions of both the solemnizers and the facilities. I had a chance to review the Connecticut statute and, and review the same the deficiency is, is basically in, the, in that this law or this draft here does nothing to uh, hold off any cause of action if in, or administrative proceeding or any civil claim or cause of action or any uh, state action against the violators uh, of this, this statute. It runs afoul of also not providing uh, coverage for the subdivisions, which would be the counties uh, in Hawaii, and it still does not... Uh, cause uh, this law and this section to fall out of the domain and jurisdiction of the uh, Civil Rights Commission. So I think these are some fatal defects that need, need to be addressed. At the very least, Mr. Speaker, it needs to be clarified because it seems strange when you have a law like this that you would state that it's uh, no such penalties, fines, injunctions, administrative proceedings, or, or other legal administrative liability, the fair or refusal to provide these services of solemnization of marriages, but yet you have no cause of action stated herein. It leads to some confusion of whether or not that was a legislative intent or was not the legislative intent. But as we learned from both Justice Levinson last week and from uh, retired Judge uh, Ahu, the law should be very clear on its face so that the courts will have judgment, will have uh, guidance on how to uh, implement the law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Representative. Further this discussion on this item here. Yes, Representative McDermott. Mr. Speaker, I stand in opposition to the amendment. Please proceed. But I, I, I appreciate the protections in here, and um, the fact that I do find it objectionable should give the majority pause to take a good look at it. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sections one. Section 1 and items 1 and 2 I, I find objectionable. And then uh, the uh, Section 572B, interpretation of terminology to be gender neutral. I understand we already do birth certificates as co-parent, although I'm not sure how a child can be created without a mom and dad, male and female. I haven't figured that out. I'm sure someone at the university can furnish me with a study that says that it is possible, but I, I haven't seen it yet with the exception of human cloning, and maybe that's just a few years down the road. But other terms like widow, what do we say? Gender neutral spouse still alive of deceased dead general ne gender neutral spouse. I mean, this is the tyranny of political correctness bordering on, in my opinion, jackassery. So for those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I will not support this, but I support the intent and the good language in there that the majority should consider because he's trying to make a point. I think he is making a point. Uh, and it's, it should be enough there to, to encourage you guys to take a look at it because I can't support it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the Mr. discussion. On the of, yes, Representative Ng. I call for the question. Question has been called. Is there a second to the question? Mr. Speaker, I second that motion. It has been second. Before we pro proceed, I... The mover of the motion will have an opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, much, much Mr. Speaker, for the three minutes on this uh, important uh, floor debate. You know, we've been hearing th repeatedly through this discussion and debate uh, that the Attorney General has approved this draft. Well, I just want to point out for the record and to enter into the record uh, several statements that the Attorney General has made over the past several weeks on this particular Senate bill. And the reason why I need to bring this amendment to the body for its consideration. In the uh, Senate draft that was uh, brought in about a week ago, this is his statement. 
This bill will allow a marriage between two individuals without regard to gender within the state of Hawaii. The Department of the Attorney General strongly supports this important measure and urges the legislature to pass it. To assist this committee, this testimony is, writ is submitted to summarize the important legal implications of the bill and how the bill's provisions relate to existing law. In the Department's view, no amendments are necessary for the bill to accomplish the bill's stated intent and purposes. That was on the, uh, the Senate draft. Fortunately, we, through the public hearing process, there was a time to debate and discuss and look at the language and propose improvements to it. And I think that was done here to some degree, although I'm not completely satisfied with it. This is the testimony that came in on the Attorney General at the uh, House Judiciary and Finance Committee hearing. The Department of the Attorney General strongly supports this important measure and urges the legislature to pass it. To assist this com committee, this testimony is submitted to summarize the important legal implications of the bill and how the bill's provisions relate to existing law. In the Department's view, no amendments are necessary for the bill to accomplish the bill's stated intent and purpose. Finally, Mr. Speaker, on a statement issued on or about November 5th, the Attorney General makes these comments. We urge the legislature to pass this bill. The bill as amended is legally sound and is in accord with the Hawaii State Constitution. This bill will provide marriage equity and fully recognize religious beliefs in that context. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Before, yes, Representative Sykes. Mr. Speaker, could you please permit members to submit written comments? Yes. Thank you. All right, members, beginning at my left, anyone who wishes to submit, please signify, Representative Hart. Mr. Speaker, may I please request permission to enter written comments into the journal? So ordered. Thank you. Anyone else on my left that wishes to submit? If not, in the middle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Finally, Rep may I please submit written comments since I wasn't allowed to speak? Yes, Representative, you may submit. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else wish to submit written comments in the middle? Uh, Mr. Speaker? On my right, written comments, Representative Foley. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Since I was not allowed to speak either, Mr. Speaker, I would like to submit written comments. So ordered, Representative. Yes, Representative Villardi, I'm sorry I didn't see you down there, but I'm on my right now. You, um, Representative Villardi. May, may I request um, to enter uh, comments in opposition? So ordered, Representative. Thank you. Anybody else on my right wish to have amendments? If not, then uh, we'll call for the question. All those in favor of stopping debate signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. All right, it has passed. So we're going to the main motion. The main motion is amendment number 21. Those in favor of amendment 21, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. We're on amendment number 22, Representative Oshiro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I propose a floor amendment 22 be adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Clerk, has, has copies been distributed? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of floor amendment number 22 have been distributed. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Marcus Oshiro for the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 22. Okay, speaker say. I'll second the motion, sir. It has been moved and seconded. Discussion, Representative Oshiro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, this is my last floor amendment for this evening. It adds the uh, inseparability clause. It clarifies the rulemaking uh, that's, that, that's contained in this bill, the Chapter 91 of the Hawaii Administrative Procedures Act. It deletes the divorce provisions that I believe are unconstitutional and, and creates problems for the, uh, for the family courts and all divorce decrees and annulments issued by the Hawaii courts. It inserts the Connecticut State's Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which I believe, which I believe is core and essential. Uh, to, the, to the effective implementation of the language contained within this bill. It clarifies that the religious exemption provisions to assure the immunity applies to administrative proceedings, administrative liabilities of the state, and all subdivisions of the state, including the counties and commissions. It also provides additional religious exemptions for individuals, Mr. Speaker. Let me spend some time on that. 
During the public hearings, both in the Senate chamber, or Senate uh, public hearing, and especially in the House hearing over the last five days, I've heard many, many, many people proclaim a concern about losing their religious freedoms protected by the Constitution under the Bill of Rights when they check into work. And then when they enter their workplace in the public or private sector, they need to leave that part of their being at the door. And that being, that part of them is left outside. What this amendment does, Mr. Speaker, is provide some protections to a sincerely held belief of an individual to bring that belief with them to the workplace and to also abide by that belief sincerely held. It allows the person to say no to certain tasks or assignments that might be opposed upon that person, Mr. Speaker. Now, not across the board, Mr. Speaker. Not across the board against any work rules or requirements of the job. But in the instance, it's a bona fide, sincerely held religious beliefs. And, and, Mr. Speaker, there's another agent or another plot, a colleague or another employee nearby who can provide the same service to the, to the general public. Th that's all it does. It's, it's real common sense thing, Mr. Speaker, and it's something that it's appropriate for people like us in Hawaii, and, and that, 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 that's what it does here. And it addresses many of the concerns raised by those who talk about what might happen to the teachers in schools. You know, if a teacher has these deeply held, sincere religious convictions, but there's another teacher who is able to help them out, is willing to do it, there shouldn't be any problem. But that's what this amendment provides, Mr. Speaker, and that's why I asked the body to consider it. And then finally, Mr. Speaker, during the discussion and debate on this bill, I heard concerns, both within the discussion and outside, that by amending the marriage laws, we might inadvertently yeah, run afoul of the cur current ERISA exemption regarding the Hawaii's Prepaid Health Care Act. And I know for you and many here in the chamber, we know how important Hawaii's Prepaid Health Care Act is and how we are very unique of all states in the country to have that ERISA exemption. In fact, several years ago, I believe the uh, uh, then the chair of the health committee and the current uh, uh, colleague of mine from Pearl City who's seeking a uh, higher office studied the issue carefully with the, uh, with the belief that the Affordable Care, Care Act may or may not impose and disrupt that fine balance and agreement we have with the federal government regarding ERISA. But I raise this as a concern, Mr. Speaker, because I have not gotten a definitive answer on this issue that was raised. And for, to preserve that argument, I have put it into this floor amendment for us to consider. But Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for this opportunity to offer this to the body. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Speaker. thank you, Representative. Representative uh, Ng and then Ha. Ng. I rise in opposition. This, Please, uh, this will be the only time I speak on um, this or any other amendment. I'd like to call for the question after as well. Uh, we live in a democratic republic, a representative democracy. We are all elected to make tough choices, and if we make the wrong choices, the people will see that we don't make any more. We were reminded of this time and time again by testifiers in our marathon five-day, 55-hour hearing. But that's the way government works. Everyday people do not have the time to discuss these issues that affect their everyday lives. They have to work. They have to feed their kids. And Mr. Their Speaker, lives. point of order. I don't know what this discussion has to do with the amendment before us. I'll get in there. So that's precisely why the people had hired us. A uh, representative from Laie mentioned that this issue has divided the people. Uh, but right now, who are they yelling at? Both sides. Uh, where is all the passion, the anger? Where is it directed to? It's directed at us. But the longer this drags out, the more we show that we cannot handle making the tough decisions, the more people will direct that anger to their neighbors. And we've already started to see that by the confrontations out on the rotunda. But we can end that division, and that's why the people hired us. I know that my colleagues on both sides of this issue have all put right, more time. Of the nature, uh to speak on the, uh, on the, the amendments, amendment. these yes. amendments. More time, more research, and have attained the most thorough understanding of this bill that they ever had on a single bill. So it's not about needing more nu nuancing and deliberation. We need to be real. Let's call a spade a, a spade. To say it's about process, and then at the last minute, we have this out of 55 hours, 
you introduce this much amendments that the public has never seen. To me, that's disingenuous. These are delay tactics. If point we're of not order, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Point of personal privilege, Mr. Speaker. Take your point. My point is, I find the comments of a gentleman who's making these personal remarks offensive, and he's called for the question. So after he says his Thank piece, you very much, he can sit down and say nothing. And Thank he's you calling very much. people disruptive. There's a Recess. TRO. that one group put against another group to shut down New Hope Church. There's a TRO that was out for the... That's my point. Representative, you make your point. I'm doing what Mr. he's Speaker doing. Recess. You make Mr. your Speaker, point. He's pointing recess. fingers. There's a TRO. The lawsuits have already begun. Recess. Right, well, house come to order, and if I can, to the good people in the gallery, if uh, if you can, uh, I know you're very passionate about the bill here, but if you can refrain from outburst and so that we can get on with the business, and I thank you all for for your patience and your time here. Okay. All right, the House come to order. And uh, Representative Foley, you asked a question of personal privilege? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, if I may. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to address some of the comments that were directed at me. And I would actually say I agree with the good representative um, from Maui on some of the, on the things that he said. He said that, you know, as statements have been made earlier, that this has, these amendments have not gone through the normal review. They're outside the normal process. They're at the last moment. And um, we just need to, we, we, we can't look at these because of the, uh, the timeliness of this. Mr. Speaker, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree with this entire process from the special session all the way to these amendments right now. Have not gone through the normal review, are outside the normal process, and have been introduced. Introduced at the very last moment. Mr. Speaker, we are talking about amendments that were never that the op, that the public never had the opportunity to review. I could not agree more. House Draft One, the public was never given the opportunity to review. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. All Mr. right, Speaker. Uh, Representative, your question was directed to the representative, and will you please direct your question, and uh, not go back to the. <laughs> your statements that you have now. Oh. You have, if you have a grievance yes, Mr. Speaker. as to the statement, state your grievance. Well, I would say that I don't have a grievance, but I can say that we stand shoulder to shoulder on amendments that have never been given to the public to review, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to agree with him to say we need to take this process further. We need the, to allow the public to review these, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Speaker. And I say thank, I, I would like to say thank you. Thank you very for, much. For bringing that up. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Speaker. Much. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're back to uh, amendment number 22. The, and uh, there Mr. was Speaker, a representative psyche call, before I, I get to harm. Call for the question, but please it has been called. To the question speak. has been called. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I believe you recognize me after you, you recognize the speaker from Kihei. You did, in fact, say that Representative Har would go after the representative from Kihei, so I would Representative Har, if you would in you wish to make written comments? Um, actually, just two minutes, Mr. Speaker. I'll be very quick. You How know about a minute? Quickly. Okay, a minute is fine. Okay, please. Thank you, please, Mr. Speaker. Please. This is in support of the amended language, but not the underlying bill. Um, again, Mr. Speaker, I think this goes back to what was said previously about balance, as well as against our First Amendment protections. I think the reason we're struggling so much with this, and the reason these four 
amendments are being uh, introduced is that in everything we do as legislators, in every three bill we pass, we have attempted to influence or regulate. For the first time, Mr. Speaker, through this, to regulate thought, freedom of conscience, the freedom to believe what one person wants to believe. And that is absolutely protected under the First Amendment. And that is why this bill is so frightening and emotional for so many people, Mr. Speaker. The people come and testify, and they yes. literally broke down. Yes, That's yes. the issue, Mr. Speaker. And so, you know, I was so moved by one gentleman, Mr. Travis Augustine. He was registered as number 3895. He said, the bottom line is this. This bill, Senate Bill 1, does not protect an individual press himself or herself it does not give us the right to believe that's not the issue the issue is not you're wrong that's not the issue the issue is under the first amendment you absolutely have those protections and so for the first time in history in the history of the state of hawaii we are now attempting and so respectfully mr speaker for these reasons i support the amended language because i urge this body to continue trying to balance the 14th amendment with first amendment protections okay. mr Thank speaker you, mr speaker much, mr speaker uh, you're not, uh, we given an opportunity to the maker of the motion to rebut. I Take like, your point. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to um, vote in support of this amendment and ask that the words of the Reverend Wahiwa be entered into the journals if there were my Very own. Good. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. So ordered, but we will get to that later. We give the opportunity to the mover of the motion to give his final statement, Representative Marcus Oshiro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, summarize the uh, contents of this bill. Again, I believe these are um, well-placed. Um, I'm a junior in, in tenure in this body. Uh, this is part and parcel of the legislative process in the State House of Representatives. Floor amendments are put down upon bills for consideration. Uh, there's nothing inappropriate to these floor amendments being made. Mr. Speaker, you and I know that these concepts and these principles here are have been debated and discussed in various forums of both formal and informal on this very important measure. Uh, you yourself, Mr. Speaker, as long as a member of the House, received a packet of information from my office containing treatises and law review, review, review documents uh, discussing this very important issue of how you balance uh, First Amendment rights with due process, equal protection, liberties. So I don't think this is out of the box being placed upon anyone by surprise. And again, Mr. Speaker, this has been the practice and procedures and traditions of this body for the last 20 years that I've been here. Regarding floor amendments, so I see nothing awry and I'm not trying to uh, take anyone by surprise. The Connecticut law, Mr. Speaker, is maybe an appropriate place to start, but let's, let's remember that. Connecticut is one of those five states that had courts by edict or by decisions grant same-sex marriage. Connecticut, California, Iowa, Massachusetts, and New Jersey are the equal and protection laws. Popular vote was done in Wisconsin, Maine, and, and Maryland. And Washington, I mean Washington, Maine, and Maryland. The state legislatures were Vermont, New Hampshire, New York, Delaware, Minnesota, and Rhode Island. And that's why I suggest we look at those states Mr. Speaker, this is such an important issue and a concern that came up several weeks ago when I was What happens if the religious exemptions are struck down as unconstitutional? Well, given the severability provision in this law, the law continues on. Without any protection to the religious uh, organized facilities or their solemnization ceremonies or their marriage. And the history is replete, Mr. Speaker, the insufficient or inadequate or questionable laws that can not provide protections and they're deemed illegal or void, there is no protections. And that's why I ask Mr. Speaker for us to consider this and really think long and deep and hard before we get to the main motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. All right, there was a question to uh, cease debate. Is there a- uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, can I have a short recess? Recess.
All right, will the House come to order? Uh, Representative Connelly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to withdraw any comments I made that um, might have been uh, taken as a personal grievance. Uh, I guess the only point I'll try to make is um, I'm ready to take the vote, face the consequences, and let the healing in our community uh, begin. Okay, you. You, uh, your remarks is withdrawn and so ordered. Representative Taiki. Mr. Speaker, I redo my call for the question. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. It is being moved and seconded. And before we go into that, I want to give the movement an opportunity to uh, have these last remarks on this bill. Mr. Speaker, thank you um, for the opportunity to have this vigorous debate. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. With that, then uh, all those in favor of the motion to cease debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Speaker. Motion is approved. Yes. Can we provide written comments for the journal, please? There's, the speaker is in error. Yes, please proceed. And, so thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I have permission to put written comments into the journal in support? So ordered, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my apologies. So we'll begin on the left. Anyone wish to submit written comments? Yes, Mr. Speaker, if I may enter, ask for permission. Hart. Thank you very much. Thank you. So ordered. Anybody else on the left who wish to have written comments? In the middle, anyone else? Yes, Representative McKelvey. Uh, in, op in opposition, uh, permission to insert written comments to the journal, and please look at page 34980B, subsection 2. Thank you very much. So ordered. Yes, Representative Polly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just uh, may I have the words of the representative from Kapolei inserted as if they were my own? So ordered. Any further written comments? If not, thank you very much. So the motion has been called already. So we'll go on the main motion. The main motion is uh, to approve amendment number 22. All those in favor of approving Amendment number 22 signified by saying aye. Those opposed say nay. Motion fails. Okay, we're going to take a recess, a very short one right now, recess. On amendment number 23 and representative Sharon Hall thank you mr. speaker mr. speaker I'd like to offer the uh, floor amendment number 23 for adoption thank you clerk has the uh, has the copies been distributed yes mr. speaker copies of floor amendment number 23 have been distributed thank you very much uh, representative Sharon Hall for the motion Mr. Speaker, I move to adopt floor amendment number 23. Is there a second to the motion? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I second the motion. Rep Representative Marcus Oshiro. 
seconds the motion. Discussion, Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I offer floor amendment number 23, and this uh, deals specifically with the section on Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, page 8 of the bill. This is section 572.1, section 3 of the bill, which really, which carves out what the prerequisites are for a valid marriage contract. So the section states, in order to make the valid uh, make valid the marriage contract, there sh it shall be between per permitted between two individuals without regard to gender. Each of the parties at the time of contracting must be at least 16 years of age. And number three, it says, neither party has at the time any lawful wife, husband, or civil union partner, civil union partner living, except as provided in section 572A. Mr. Speaker, the amendment that I offer, um, and to be clear, I support the amended language and not the underlying bill, is to clarify that we should include the words reciprocal beneficiaries, domestic partners, or any other party to any other legally recognized union. The point is we want to terminate these other contractual relationships so that we're not promoting uh, additional benefits. So for example, the way this bill is written right now, Mr. Speaker, I could be in a domestic partnership in the state of California with a same-sex person. I could then come to California, uh, excuse me, Hawaii, and then I could enter into a same-sex marriage, not dissolve or terminate that domestic partnership, get into a same-sex marriage with somebody else, and obtain all those benefits. So I could get benefits with another partner in the state of California through my domestic partnership, as well as in the state of Hawaii through my same-sex marriage license. And I don't think that's the intent of this, Mr. Speaker. So I just wanted to be clear. This was, in fact, asked to the Attorney General. He did recognize it as an issue. He said it would have to go to the courts in order to be clarified. And, Mr. Speaker, again, I submit that if any of our laws that we pass go before the courts for judicial review, we have failed. This is truly a friendly amendment to ensure that polygamy doesn't exist and that we do. The intent really is to terminate all of the other existing relationships so that all the benefits will carry in the same-sex uh, marriage. So uh, respectfully, Mr. Speaker, I do stand in support of this floor amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative, for the discussion on this item. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Yes, Representative Rhodes. Uh, in opposition. Uh, uh, please proceed. With regard to the domestic, uh, with regard to the reciprocal beneficiary relationship concern, uh, current law, HRS 5726-7 says, D, says if either party to a reciprocal beneficiary relationship enters into a legal marriage, the party shall no longer have a reciprocal beneficiary relationship. So uh, that moots the need for that part of the amendment. Uh, with regard to the unions uh, performed in other jurisdictions, HRS 572B-10 uh, in essence says that if you have a relationship in another state that is equivalent to a civil union, we'll treat it like a civil union, which can then be converted to marriage through the rules that, that are in this bill. So for those reasons, I uh, oppose the, uh, the floor amendment. Thank you. All right, further discussion on this item? Not Mr. Uh, Speaker, just briefly, bottom. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to thank the chairman of the, the Judiciary Committee and for the speaker for allowing me to insert this amendment. I think something that we have to look the, at very carefully is on page 8, line 8, except is that, which clearly states, except as provided in Section 572A of Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. And it clearly states in that section of the bill that you will have continuous rights for a re reciprocal beneficiaries and civil union partners, and they will be terminated upon a same-sex marriage solemnization. So already this section conflicts because this section on page 8 only talks about civil union partners, whereas, and then it says, except as provided in 572A, and then 572A specifically refers to civil unions and reciprocal beneficiaries. So there's a conflict right now on its face in this bill. For those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I respectfully ask that this body support the floor amendment. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Further discussion on this item? If not, Representative uh, Psyche. Do you want to call for, the, call question? for the question? The question has been called. Uh, Second. It has been seconded. All those in favor of the question? Well, let, let's put it this way. Let me go back a little bit. Is there anyone want to have written comments? Begin on the left before I call for the motion. Mr. Speaker, may I please request permission to enter additional written comments into the journal? So ordered, Thank Representative. You. Anyone else on the left? 
On the middle, any written comments? On the right, any written comments? Then all those in favor of... Uh, Mr. Speaker? Of, yes. Uh, may I have written comments? So ordered, Representative Foley. Anyone else? If not, then all those in favor of stopping debate, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. it. Debate for end. And now we're going on to the main motion on Stencom Report Number 23. All those in favor, Stencom Report Number 23, signify. What's the problem? <laughs> Of, of the amendment, <laughs> of the amendment, everybody getting tired. Uh, all those in favor of amendment number 23, signify by saying aye. Those opposed, say no, nay. Motion fails. Okay, we're on uh, amendment number 24. Uh, Representative Haar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to offer floor amendment number 24 to be considered by the body. Thank you very much. Clerk, do we have the, uh, that being distributed on number 24? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Copies of floor amendment number 24 have been distributed. Thank you very much. Representative Haar, will you make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 24. Is there a second to the motion? Speaker. Uh, Representative second. McDermott. Second the motion. Second the motion. Thank you very much. It has been moved and seconded that amendment number 24 pass. Uh, Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of floor amendment 24. Again, this is a very similar problem that we just had in floor amendment number 23. It deals with a separate section of Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, and it deals on page 9 regarding the application for a license and limitations. It says, to secure a license to marry, the persons applying for the license shall appear personally before an agent authorized to grant marriage licenses and shall file with the agent an application in writing. The application shall be accompanied by a statement signed and sworn to by each of the persons, setting forth the person's full name, date of birth, social security number, residents, their relationship, if any, the full names of parents, and that all prior marriages or civil unions, if any, other than an existing civil union between the persons applying for the marriage license, have been dissolved by death or dissolution. If all prior marriages and civil unions, other than existing civil unions between the persons applying for the marriage licenses, have been dissolved by death or dissolution, the statement shall also set forth the date of the death of the last prior spouse or the date and jurisdiction in which the last decree or of dissolution was entered. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the friendly amendment that I am offering is to include the words reciprocal beneficiaries or domestic partnerships or other legally recognized unions. Um, again, I think that the intent of this measure is to ensure that people who are entering into marriages do not have other contractual contractually recognized marriages out there, whether you want to call them reciprocal beneficiaries, domestic partnerships. In this situation, we've limited it only to civil unions. And again, I don't think that was the intent as based on 572A in this, in this particular bill. It makes it very clear that reciprocal beneficiaries and civil unions will in fact extinguish upon the solemnization of a marriage. And so we've left out the terms reciprocal beneficiaries or domestic partnerships. And again, Mr. Speaker, as we know, same-sex marriage is in fact legal in other countries. So I'm not sure what the language is, what they call it. They may call it some other reiteration. But just to be clear, we added in the catch-all, which would be, or other legally recognized unions, just to ensure that those relationships are in fact terminated so that we don't have people who have multiple benefits from multiple different relationships, essentially polygamy, Mr. Speaker. So for those reasons, again, I offer this friendly amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, for the discussion, Representative Rhodes. Mr. Speaker, in opposition, uh, for the same reason that I opposed floor amendment number 23, I oppose floor amendment 24. Thank you. Thank you very much for the discussion on this item. If not, Mr. Then, Speaker? Yes, Representative um, uh, Could I have the words? Carol? 
in, in um, support. Could I have the words from the representative from Kapolei to be inserted in the journal as my own? Sorted, Representative. Thank you. Any uh, further for written comments before I call for the... Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, same request. Sorted. Mr. Speaker, if I may, just a brief rebuttal. Well, I Please. Well, I, while I very much appreciate the comments from the, my chairman, from the Judiciary Committee, um, again, I don't know if it was the intent of this body to sanction multiple relationships, multiple uh, partners. I don't think that was our intent. But if again, if you read this language very carefully, it only requires that a prior marriage or civil union be extinguished. So it does not require that reciprocal beneficiaries, domestic partnerships, or other legally recognized unions be terminated before entering into a marriage in the state of Hawaii. Again, I do not believe it's the intent of this body to sanction polygamy or multiple relationships, contractual relationships. So again, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues and the chair of the Judiciary Committee to please consider this friendly amendment. Thank, thank you very you, much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Yes, Rep uh, Representative, thank Mr. You. Speaker, I call for the question. Question has been called. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Anyone wish to have some written comments to this item here? If not, then uh, we'll, we'll call for the question. All those in favor of stopping debate or ceasing debate signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Motion is passed. So now we go into the, the amendment, amendment number 24. Those who are in favor of amendment number 24 signify by saying aye. And those signify, those opposed say no. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed? The amendment fails. Okay, right now we're on amendment number 25. Representative uh, Haar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to offer floor amendment 25 for consideration by the body. Thank you very much. Clerk, has, has copies been distributed? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of floor amendment number 25 have been distributed. Thank you very much. And Representative Hall for the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 25. You have a second to the motion. Yes, Representative. Oshiro second the motion. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Thank you very much. Representative Ha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, I offer a friendly, friendly floor amendment number 25. Um, this deals with page 3 of Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. On page 3, section 2, continuity of rights, civil union, and reciprocal beneficiary relationships. And this is a section that makes it very clear that a civil union couple or a reciprocal beneficiary couple um, who seek to enter into a marriage um, may do so without first terminating their civil union or reciprocal beneficiary relationship, provided that certain things occur first. And what's interesting in this section, Mr. Speaker, is if you move to page four of the bill, lines eight through 15, section D, it clearly states here that the rights, benefits, protections, and responsibilities created by the civil union or reciprocal beneficiary relationship shall be continuous through the marriage and deemed to have accrued as of the first date these rights existed under the civil union or reciprocal beneficiary relationship, provided that the civil union or reciprocal beneficiary relationship was in effect at the time of the solemnization of the couple's marriage to each other. Mr. Speaker, the uh, floor amendment that I've offered would strike this section, and essentially what we're doing right here is we are allowing people to require rights in other people's, other person's properties um, retroactively. So essentially what we're saying is upon the solemnization of a marriage, if you had a prior relationship, a prior relationship pursuant to a reciprocal beneficiary or a civil union, now all of a sudden any rights vested back then. The problem with this section, Mr. Speaker, as uh, that is, is being proposed is the fact that same-sex marriage was not legal in 1997 when reciprocal beneficiaries were enacted. So it creates a problem. You're now trying to vest an interest in personal property and assets when same-sex marriage was not in fact legal in 1997 when reciprocal beneficiaries was first passed. And the same argument goes for civil unions, Mr. Speaker. Um, again, many same-sex couples may not want that. 
So I just think that we need to proceed with caution. Again, Mr. Speaker, to be clear, I am not a family law attorney, but I was in fact contacted by many of my friends who are family law attorneys, uh, as well as estate planners. They say this is a very problematic section. And again, this is not necessarily equal, Mr. Speaker, so we have to proceed with caution in these issues. We cannot create more family law problems, and this section does in fact do that, which is why I'm offering the amendment that would delete, respectfully delete this section. So for those reasons, Mr. Speaker, again, I stand in support of the amended language and not the underlying All right, Representative, thank, thank you much uh, for the discussion. Representative Rhodes. Mr. Speaker, uh, oppose the amendment. Uh, Please proceed. Yeah. If you look at page 4, line 3 through 7, the act of seeking a license for or entering into a marriage under this chapter shall not diminish any of the rights, benefits, protections, and responsibilities that existed previously due to the couple's earlier status as civil union partners or reciprocal beneficiaries. Uh, reciprocal beneficiaries, civil union members, and, and uh, married couples do not have exact... The rights aren't all the same, but some of them are. And all this does is allow, for example, if you're in a beneficiary relationship, uh, reciprocal beneficiary relationship, you can go visit your partner in the hospital when other people are not allowed to, uh, a, a situation like that. So can someone in a civil union, so can someone who is married. So all this provision does is allow those rights that the, the uh, reciprocal beneficiaries and civil union members had to continue on uninterrupted into the marriage relationship if they choose to become married if they were in one of those relationships before. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the discussion on this item. Mr. Speaker, please yes. rebuttal. Please proceed. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I very much appreciate the comments provided by the Judiciary Chair, but I think he just underscored the problem with this bill. So he just read Section C, the act of seeking a license for or entering into a marriage under this chapter shall not diminish any of the rights, benefits, protections, and responsibilities that existed previously due to the couple's earlier status as civil union partners or reciprocal beneficiaries. Again, Mr. Speaker, then you know what? I submit that Section D is essentially, it, it's essentially repeating what's in Section C. It's unnecessary. It's, it's basically redundant because I agree with, with what he says in Section C. So why we have Section D is it's, 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 un, we, it's unnecessary. It's basically redundant, and therefore, for the same reasons, Mr. Speaker, I respectfully request that we pass floor amendment number 25. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Sankey. Mr. Speaker, I call for the question. Yeah. Question has been called there second. a second. It has been moved in second. Any written comments on those on my left? Mr. Speaker, Power. may I please request permission to enter additional written comments into the so journal? Order, Thank you. Any written comments on those in the middle? Representative uh, Marcus O'Shea. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Written comments, please. So ordered, Representative. Thank you. Anyone else in the middle? If not, any written comments for those on my right? If there's none, then I'm going to be calling for the vote on a question. All those in favor of something debate, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passed. The debate is stopped. We're going to the main amendment and, and the amendment number 25. All those in favor of amendment tw number 25 signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. no. Motion fails. We're on number 26, Representative Haar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to offer floor amendment number 26 to be considered by the body. Clerk, has, has, has copies been distributed? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of floor amendment number 26 have been distributed. Thank you very much, and Representative Hall for the, for the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 26. There is a second to the motion, and Representative Marcus O'Shea will second. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Thank you very much. Thank it you. Has, it has been moved and seconded. Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the amended language and not the underlying bill, to be clear. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this section is actually right after the previous section we just previously discussed in Floor Amendment 25. So on page 4 of Senate Bill Number 1, House Draft 1, lines 16 through 19, Section E states, any rights, benefits, protections, and responsibilities created by the solemnization of a marriage that were not included within the reciprocal beneficiary relationship shall be recognized as of the date the marriage was solemnized. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, the reason I offer this floor amendment, it would be to strike this section because it seems to conflict with the previous section that said that all rights benefits should exist. So now all of a sudden we're saying any rights and benefits that were not recognized, all of a sudden will only go back to the date of the marriage. What is it? Is it going to go, are we doing it back to the date of the RB or the civil union or is it now date of solemnization? We're conflicting. Again, there's a ma major problems in this bill, Mr. Speaker. For those reasons, I continue to submit that this floor amendment is a friendly floor amendment. I wish that the body and the judiciary chair would seek these amendments and take them very seriously. For Thank those reasons, I support the language. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you very much, Representative. Representative Rhodes. Uh, in opposition to the floor amendment. State, state your opposition. Well, basically, my arguments are the same as the vice chair's. Uh, any rights, benefits, protections, and responsibilities created by the solemnization of a marriage that were not in which were not included within the reciprocal beneficiary relationship shall be recognized as of the date the marriage was solemnized. And that's the whole point, that some, some of the benefits of marriage, there are more benefits to marriage than there are of civil unions or uh, reciprocal beneficiary relationships, and that's why you have to have this provision. Mahalo. Thank you very much uh, for the discussion. Yes, Representative Folly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in, in support of the amendment. Please uh, proceed. Mr. Speaker, I am... <clears throat> During the course of the 55-hour uh, hearings, we heard a lot of discussion from a number of attorneys, which included the Attorney General, regarding some of the problems that currently exist in the bill that would have to go to court. Mr. Speaker, I think it's problematic if we are going to put the people of Hawaii through the, through the expensive transactions of going through the court system to deal with some of the deficiencies that exist within this bill, uh, Mr. Speaker. So I believe we also, through those hearings, we... Um, came across a number of problems that exist in regards to legislative intent and the ambiguity that exists in languages, in language, in the language of bills that become problematic um, for the actual legislation. Mr. Speaker, this is an opportunity for us to address some of those um, problematic issues that we know that do exist, that the uh, Attorney General himself acknowledged very clearly are problematic with the bill. And Mr. Speaker, if we are going to put the people of Hawaii through a very expensive court process to find out what exactly some of this language means. Mr. Speaker, we shouldn't put the people of Hawaii through that. We should take advantage of the opportunity now. We should demonstrate leadership and make these amendments to the bill if this bill is going to pass to make sure that we are not laying a burden upon people but actually um, just displaying leadership and making sure that we are addressing issues as we see them and we know they exist, Mr. Speaker. The Attorney General said as much, and for those reasons, I do support the, um, the amendment. Thank you, Representative Foley. For the discussion, re rebuttal. Yes, uh, Representative uh, Carroll. Um, in support, and I'd like permission to have um, comments um, inserted to the journal and also have the words of the representative from Kapolei to be my own. So ordered, Representative. <laughs> okay. Can we have a rebuttal, please, from Representative Hawes? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, first and foremost, I don't disagree with the Chair of Judiciary, but I continue to submit, um, if we are in fact going to do this, we're going to move in this direction, let's do it correctly. And so all I'm saying is, is again, these are friendly floor amendments. I am genuinely trying to improve this bill for our same-sex couples. If this, in fact, is going to pass, why would you have two separate dates? I understand, again, whatever was not included, but we can try to find some, we can reconcile this. And again, the previous floor amendment, um, it just seems to be contradictory. Um, and again, finally, Mr. Speaker, I do take great umbrage to the fact that we are being rushed in this. I understand that people are frustrated, but this is the democratic process. We debate, we usually don't have 10 minutes on a floor amendment. And these are all brand new floor amendments, Mr. Speaker, you know that. And so um, I'm a little bit, you know, it's, it's a little bit upsetting for me because uh, democracy is not being allowed to take place in action right now. I understand that everybody is anxious to vote, but the fact of the matter is these are very serious floor amendments and they are friendly as I've indicated. I want to make this law the best that it can be. As one of our teachers said in a hearing, when I teach my kids do your best, have you folks done your best? And Mr. Speaker, I would submit we haven't done our best in this bill, particularly for our same-sex couples. So why wouldn't we make it better? That's all I'm saying. It's not about being for the bill. It's not about being against. It's about making the best law possible. And I would submit that's not it. And that's the reason for these friendly floor amendments, Mr. Speaker. So for those reasons, I continue to stand in support of the amended language. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Representative. Mr. Representative Speaker, Shaiki. I call for the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Representative Rhodes, second? I second. 
It has been moved and seconded. Before I call for the question, all those, I mean, those on the right side, if you wish to have written comments, uh, please signify. Those in the middle, if you wish to have written comments. Yes, Thank Representative Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the, op um, the amendment, and I'd like to ask that the words from the representative from Kapolei be entered into the journal as if they were my own, and also some additional comments. So ordered, Thank Representative. You, Speaker. Anyone else? Representative Marcus Oshiro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Written comments, please. So ordered. Thank you. Anyone Mr. else Speaker? in the middle? Yes, we're now going to the right. Representative Bilotti. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, submit written comments in opposition. So ordered. Anyone else on the right who wish to have make any comments? If not, then we'll go into the motion to cease the uh, debate. All those in favor of to cease debate, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion is passed. So we're going to amendment number 26. Those who are in favor of Amendment number 26, signify by saying aye. aye. Those who oppose, signify by saying nay. Point of information, Mr. Speaker, yes. point of information. Motion uh, fails for... Uh, are, you, are you calling correct. these amendments out by vote only and not by the representative who introduced them? Um, Speaker, yes. I'm either confused or you're doing stuff that's confusing. Which has? All right, members, will house them to order, please. And we are now on amendment number 27, Representative Ha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to offer floor amendment number 27 to be considered by the body. Thank you very much. And clerk, has, has copies been distributed? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of floor amendment number 27 have been distributed. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Hall for the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move to um, adopt floor amendment number 27. Is there a second to the motion? Speaker, I second that. It has been, been seconded by Haitian. Okay, Representative Hall. Thank you. Th thank you to, this, to the representative from Hawaii, Kai, or excuse me, Kahala. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of Floor Amendment 27. Again, this is a friendly amendment. Um, Mr. Speaker, on page 11 of Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, this is Section 6 of the Marriage Statute, Section 572-13. And this section discusses those who solemnize, those who actually solemnize a marriage, a ceremony. And in section B of the marriage statute in 572.13, it states, marriages reported by whom? It shall be the duty of every person 
legally authorized to perform the marriage ceremony to report within three days every marriage ceremony performed by that person to the agent of the Department of Health in the district in which the marriage takes place, setting forth all facts required to be stated in a standard certificate of marriage, the form and contents of which shall be described by the Department of Health. Now the uh, additional language that was amended in Senate Bill Number 1, House Draft 1 is, provided that if any person who has solemnized a marriage fails to report it to the agent of the Department of Health, the parties married may provide the Department of Health with a notarized affidavit attesting to the fact that they were married and stating the date and time and place of the solemnization of the marriage. Upon receipt of that affidavit by the Department of Health, the marriage shall be deemed valid as of the date of the solemnization stated in the affidavit, provided that the requirements of 572-1 are met. Mr. Speaker, again, this amends the marriage statute. What this does is it almost renders solemnization moot because we already know in the statute as it exists, the person who solemnizes is currently under a duty to report to the Department of Health, and that's it, within three days. But what we're adding in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, is language that says, however, if that person fails to report, the two persons who were married, all they have to do is fill out an affidavit, send it into the Department of Health. Once the Department of Health gets it, they're married. So we're now incentivizing fraud which I don't think is the intent of this measure. Again, this applies to both same-sex couples and heterosexual couples. So my point is, if there's no solemnization necessary, why are we even solemnizing in this bill? This section essentially renders solemnization moot. So why are we doing solemnization then, if this section exists, if this proposed language in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1 exists? It doesn't make any sense. We either take this section out, otherwise we have been derelict by basically promoting fraudulent marriages. And in essence, solemnization is not necessary with the language as it stands in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. So again, Mr. Speaker, for these reasons, I submit this very friendly amendment. Um, and I hope that the members will support the amended language. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, Further discussion, Representative Rhodes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In opposition, um, solemnizations are actually necessary under the language. Um, so the affidavits that are required, if for some reason the, um, the paperwork is not forwarded, uh, there's no, there, there's no um, accusation or allegation made. It may be purely accidental that it was not submitted, but uh, those who are married may need to, to um, move forward even if the if the uh, required paperwork is not submitted by the solemnizer, but the solemnization has to have occurred. Uh, the affidavits themselves are a, a, a check against fraud because uh, you sign an affidavit under oath. I don't remember what the crime is exactly if you, uh, if you do that uh, falsely, but it is a crime, and uh, that's, that's the check on the fraud. Thank you. Thank you very much for the discussion, members. If not, then Representative... Uh... Mr. Speaker? Rep let me have Representative Jordan. She's been wanting to speak, and I'm sorry to missing you. Please uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm support of the amendment number 27. Yes. Um, I think that language should be stricken too, and we should just go with what originally we have in the statute. Um, I would like to have a person to submit written comments also. Okay. May I? Sure. Thank you. Okay, for the discussion, Representative uh, Marcus Oshiro. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, the more I look at this uh, language here, I, I, stand in, uh, I stand in support of the floor amendment uh, in, in, opposite the, in opposite to the current draft. Yeah, the more I, the more I look at it, um, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I did have a chance to listen in on the uh, Senate hearing down at the uh, Senate Judiciary Labor Committee, and I never heard any requests come in for this particular language. I don't even know why it's in, in here but a necessity for us to, mar uh, to amend the marriage statute to allow this. Uh, it seems quite extraordinary given the requirements for the solemnizers uh, who have to uh, basically submit the uh, proper paperwork within the requisite period of time 
that they in fact solemnize the union uh, of, of the couple, which requires the solemnizers to be there physically along with the uh, couple uh, in the state of Hawaii. And those requirements are important because, again, to submit to the jurisdiction of the state of Hawaii and the laws therein. So I really don't understand why you would want to uh, allow something like this. If the person uh, is, is, is habitually late in submitting their, their solemnization documents, perhaps you should, you should uh, rescind their license or their permit to uh, solemnize marriages. I, I, don't, I don't know why you would want to do something like this and basically create a situation where a third party, not, uh, not in the, involved in the solemnization of the marriage ceremony, Mr. Speaker, to be faced with this conundrum of not having the proper documentation and yet, from their perspective, from their perspective, a warranting or perceiving a, a, a marriage ceremony and all the accoutrements thereof, and from that perspective, moving forward, believing this couple may or may not be married, in this in instance, without having the proper uh, documentation. So I, I don't understand the necessity for this. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, in the uh, Judiciary and Finance Committee, again, I didn't hear any testimony regarding the necessity for this amendment to our, our marriage laws. Again. The basic laws require a solemnizer who is there to witness that you have these component requirements to be physically present, the solemnizer, the two people getting married, all in the same place at the same time on the same date. That's part and parcel of how we assure the integrity of our system. So I don't really understand why you have this here, and I, move, I support the uh, current floor amendment. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. you, Representative uh, and Representative uh, Hall, for your final rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I very much appreciate the comments made from the Chair of Judiciary. Um, however, again, um, as noted by the Speaker from Wahiwa, the fact of the matter is, is you need a third party who is in fact going to solemnize the marriage. And yes, it is required, but with this proposed language that is now in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, it's actually not necessary. If for whatever reason the solemnizer forgets to submit his paperwork to the Department of Health, the two parties now do it. Now again, this doesn't only apply to same-sex couples, it applies to all couples. So you're taking away essentially the solemnization component because all you really need now is an affidavit by the two married people. Again, I don't think that's the intent of this language, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're entering into very dangerous territory. Why are we having solemnization if we're going to have this language in there? Um, while I respect the Judiciary Chair's comments that there are checks and balances, the fact of the matter is if people understand the statute, there does not in fact have to be a solemnizer, and there could in fact be fraud. And I don't think that that's what we're supporting. So again, for those reasons, I offer this very friendly four amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Representative Psyche. I move, I call for the question. The question has been called. Second. There a second. It's moved and second to call for the question before we go into it with you'll be given an opportunity to submit comments. Anybody on my left want to submit comments? Representative Hall? May I request permission to enter additional written comments into the Thank journal? You. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone else on the left submit comments? Anyone in the middle to submit comments? And on the, my right, anyone to submit comments? There's none, then we're gonna call for the question. On the issue, all those in favor on the question to cease debate, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, and nay. Motion is passed. Now we're back to the amendment number 27. Those in favor of amendment number 27, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, say nay. Nay. Amendment fails. Okay, we're on amendment number 28, Representative Shaw. Uh, Har. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm Mr. Getting Sp <laughs> it's okay. I get called Shar Har a lot. It's okay. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I would like to offer floor amendment number 28 to be considered by the body. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, clerk, has, has, has copies been distributed? Yes, Mr. Speaker, copies of floor amendment number 28 have been distributed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Har. Uh, will you make the motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 28. Thank you very much. Is there a second to the motion? Mr. Speaker, Representative. Mr. Speaker, Representative Oshiro, I second the motion. Representative Marcus Oshiro, second the motion. Discussion? 
Representative Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, in floor uh, amendment number 28, again, I support the amended language and not the underlying bill. Uh, the friendly amendment that is being offered in this section deals specifically with the religious exemption language contained in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. Um, a particular note on page 6 of Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, line 16 through uh, page 7, line 2. The current language in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1 states, a religious organization or nonprofit organization operated supervised or controlled by a religious organization that pursuant to this section fails or refuses to provide goods, services, or its facilities or grounds for the solemnization or celebration of a marriage shall be immune from any fine, penalty, injunction, administrative proceeding, or any other legal or administrative liability for the failure or refusal. Mr. Speaker, the language offered in this Friendly Floor Amendment number 28 would essentially change Section B that is in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, and it would change it to the language stating this. Any refusal to provide goods, services, facilities, or grounds in accordance with this section shall not create any civil claim or cause of action or result in any state action to penalize or withhold benefits from such religious organization or nonprofit organization operated, supervised, or controlled by a religious organization. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the committee report, it makes clear that we have uh, based the religious exemption language on language that was from Connecticut, the state of Connecticut. And actually, Mr. Speaker, the amendment that I offer deals is actually directly from the Connecticut language. Um, essentially what it does is it's just very awkward, quite frankly, the language that we've offered. Um, we don't deal with civil claims or causes of action, which all the, that, this is the language, the, the language that I've offered is all the other states that have same-sex marriage with respect to causes of action, civil claims, or state action. The language that we have is, is tenuous and instead of dealing with a claim or cause of action on the front end. I think the point here is that we really want to ensure that no cause, no, uh, no complaint can be filed for an alleged breach of this religious exemption clause. So that being the case, what we want to do is ensure that from the outset it's clear, no cause of action, no civil claim, no state action can be taken. And therefore, for those lawyers of us in the room, a Rule 11 motion will then for be granted. With the language that's currently in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, it makes it a little bit tenuous as to whether you would even, you, if you, whether you could survive a Rule 11 motion. So, sorry, I don't mean to get into the minutia, the legalese, but for those lawyers of us in the room, it's, it's a little bit tenuous, quite frankly, and for those reasons, I do offer this friendly floor amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Representative, uh, for the discussion. Representative Rhodes, you wish to uh, comment? Representative Rhodes, anyone else wish to comment on this issue? Mr. Speaker? Yes, Representative Marcus Oshiro. Yeah, I rise in support of this uh, floor amendment. Please proceed. Yeah, this is a very uh, important floor amendment, Mr. Speaker, because it's part and parcel of the so-called protections that are given to religious institutions, uh, solemnizers, or the use of the facilities. Uh, if this particular provision is, uh, or privileges uh, of the religious solemnizer um, unconstitutional or invalid, uh, then in effect you have no protection uh, for the religious institutions of any cause of action that could be brought against them or any defensive claims that they may be able to raise uh, when that when the claims or um, charges are brought, brought against them. And what that means, Mr. Speaker, is that this, this entire portion of the uh, act or the, or the bill or the act uh, could be ruled uh, invalid or unconstitutional and could be challenged. And as been said many, many times before, this particular provisions that, are for, that supposedly provide protections to the religious organizations, even this narrowest of senses, the narrowest of purposes fall away, there is absolutely no protection of the law for non-solemnization. And what that means, Mr. Speaker, is that they would have to comply with the uh, other rules and regulations requiring the solemnization of marriages or face penalty, fine, or even the loss of license. And I think that's why it's so important for us to go back in and to correct this deficiency uh, in this draft. 
If we do not do that, uh, the concern that I have, the fear that I have, is that this particular provision could be ruled invalid, unconstitutional, and thereby not pro provide any of the protections that we apparently seek to provide to the religious institutions regarding solemnization of marriages and or use of or lease of their facilities. For those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I stand in strong support of this floor amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. For the discussion on this, minor, on this item, uh, Representative Hart, would you wish to defend uh, Marcus or yourself? <laughs> No, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, may I request permission to enter additional written comments into the journal as the chair did not rebut this point. Thank okay, you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, further discussion, if not, Representative Psyche. Representative. Mr. Speaker, I call for the question. Question has been called. Uh, Representative Rhodes. Second. It has moved and seconded for to call a question. We'll begin at my left. If those want to have any written comments, uh, Please uh, signify. Those in the middle. Yes, Representative Marcus Oshiro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Written comments in the journal, please. So ordered. Thank you. Anyone else? Written comments. Okay. On the right, Representative Fali. Uh, Mr. Speaker, written comments, please. Thank you very much. So ordered. Anyone else? If not, then we'll call on the motion to cease debate. All those in favor to cease debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion passed. Now we're on the main uh, amendment, amendment number 28. Those who wish to vote for amendment number 28 signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. Yay. The amendment fails. We're on amendment number 29, Representative Ha. Mr. Speaker, may we have a brief recess, please? Recess. Thank you. Will the House come to order? It has come to my attention there's some members in the gallery.
it has come to my attention that some members in the gallery of uh, whenever an Ionese um, call, they're, they're repeating the I's and nays, and that's good. You're, you're having a lesson in parliamentary procedure, and uh, thank you very much for, for your participation, but please uh, have uh, the respect for the members who are speaking. Thank you very much. And uh, Representative Haitian, will you please take your seat? Thank you very much. Okay, we're on, uh, we're on amendment number 29, Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to offer floor amendment number 29 for consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Clerk, uh, have, have copies been distributed to the members? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Copies of floor amendment number 29 have been distributed. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Hall for your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move for the adoption of floor amendment number 29. Thank you. Uh, Representative Marcus Oshiro. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. It has been moved and seconded. Discussion, Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, again, I offer this friendly floor amendment number 29. Um, I would direct the member's attention to page 6 of Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, the religious exemption language. Um, I want to thank the Chair of Judiciary um, for inserting uh, this language and he's made it very clear that he does not believe that this new language interferes with our public accommodations law. So when you read the language, it clearly states on page 6, lines 8 through 15, 572E religious organizations exemption under certain circumstances. Notwithstanding any law to the contrary, so notwithstanding any law, other law to the contrary, a religious organization or nonprofit organization operated, supervised, or controlled by a religious organization shall not be required to provide goods, services, or its facilities or grounds for the solemnization or celebration of a marriage that is in violation of its religious beliefs or faith. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have had intense debate ad nauseum regarding the public accommodation language. And, you know, I've, I've talked to my esteemed colleague, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and he, in fact, continues to contend that this notwithstanding any other law to the contrary is what essentially exempts the churches from public accommodations. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would have to respectfully disagree because if you turn to page Four, excuse me, page 9 of the Standing Committee report, it clearly states under the findings and intent. And for those of you watching us on Capitol TV, the committee report is what will forever go into history as our legislative intent, should this bill ever go before a court for judicial review. And it clearly states here on page 9, it is your committee's intent that the religious exemptions contained in this measure shall not alter Hawaii's long-standing prohibition against discrimination by places of public accommodation except to the limited extent specified in this measure and in the limited context of solemnization or celebration of a marriage or civil union. Mr. Speaker, throughout the 57 plus hours of testimony that we received, many, many of those from the faith-based community talked about the fact that by their very nature they are public accommodations. And as such, they had grave concerns because they understood that regardless of whatever exemption we put into this bill, they could still be subjected to Chapter 489, which is a civil rights uh, statute. And so while you know, I want to thank the Judiciary Chair for this language that says notwithstanding any other law to the contrary, because in the bill itself it makes it clear that if there is a public accommodations issue, the bill trumps. <clears throat> However, if you go to the Standing Committee report, that conflicts. The Standing Committee report makes clear that public accommodations trump exemptions. I think we have a problem here, Mr. Speaker. Again, one of the things I advocated for in the 57 plus hour hearing was to have an explicit carve out so that we would not in fact have this bill go before the judiciary for judicial review. The fact of the matter is, based on the conflicting language in the Standing Committee report, as well as in the bill, there is a conflict. 
And so if the court finds a conflict, it would then have to go to the committee report. And what the committee report is advocating for is that Chapter 489 trumps or supersedes First Amendment under the U.S. Constitution. Is that constitutional? I would submit that it is not. And so, Mr. Speaker, I do have some, again, very serious concerns about Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. And accordingly, I'm making these friendly amendments to ensure that we do not have issues, whether it's for our faith-based community. Again, it's about balancing First Amendment and 14th Amendment, and which is why I don't believe this bill achieves that objective, which is why I'm offering these friendly floor amendments. For those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I stand in support of the amended language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Howe. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Speaker? Yes, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In support of this amendment, floor amendment please, 29. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, during those long hearings, we heard from former judge and now Pastor Ahu and he clearly explained to everybody in the room, as well as the committee, we need to have bright lines. We don't want to end up in the courts. And many people understood this public accommodation law. And I think this is something that can help resolve the issues that we have been hearing and make a clear and bright for our organizations that practice their deep beliefs. So, Mr. Speaker, I think this is very doable for everybody at this point in time. And I would consider the body to really look at this. It would greatly help the two sides. May I ask for written comments to place into the journal and support? Sure, order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For the discussion, uh, Representative Bilotti. Mr. Speaker, in opposition, and I'll be very brief. Please, uh, please proceed. Um, while I don't agree with the um, uh, floor amendment being proposed, the idea of it, I think subsection C on its face goes well beyond an explicit carve out for public accommodation and in fact gives absolute immunity to religious and or organizations or nonprofit organizations from any civil claim. Mr. Speaker, the state and the federal government don't even have absolute immunity from any civil claim or cause of action. So for that reason, I oppose this. Um, Thank floor you amendment. very Thank much, you. Representative. Uh, Representative Rhodes. Mr. Speaker, in uh, opposition. Please uh, proceed. With regard to the question about the committee report, if you read the whole sentence, if you read the whole sentence, it is in your committee's in, it is your committee's intent that the religious exemptions contained in this measure shall not alter Hawaii's longstanding prohibition against discrimination by places of public accommodation, except to the limited extent specified in this measure, and to the in the limited context of solemnization or celebration of a marriage or a civil union perfectly consistent with the underlying language and it's a clear overriding of the public accommodations law. Mahalo. Thank you very much, Speaker. Representative, for the discussion. Yes, Representative uh, Ward. Speaker, I rise in support of the amendment. Please. Proceed. Speaker, precisely because of the uncertainty of the language in answer to the questions to Attorney General Louis to Mr. Hoshijo of the Civil Rights Commission, this amendment is very, very necessary. Otherwise, we're just going to have a court case back and forth. It's going to be ping pong in the courts. That is not the intent of legislation that's meant to keep a community with rights, benefits, and a religious community which has had a few, 237 years of First Amendment rights. The less clear, the more litigation. Mr. Speaker, I think we can do better if this gives us a chance to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative, uh, Representative Hall. Will you give the last rebuttal? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Uh, still in support of the floor amendment, uh, the amended language. Mr. Speaker, um, I'd like to note that jurisdictions in the United States of marriage, 14 states and the District of Columbia, of the flies, same-sex marriage, 11 states have passed it through legislatures. As we know, Illinois was the most recent. Eight. Ten states re exempt religious organizations from public accommodations. Ten states. So ten legislatures explicitly acknowledged that religious organizations would be exempt from accommodations. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I would go, these are not Bible Belt states. Again, we're talking about Vermont, Connecticut, New York, Maryland. I mean, these are not the Bible Belt states. These are very progressive states, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, finally, I would submit, again, I mentioned this the night uh, in the hearing, excuse me, the day when we were, uh, were voting out this bill in the Judiciary and Finance Committees. The state of Washington 
the state of Washington, which is considered the third most atheist state in the United States of America, a state that has legalized pakololo, smoking marijuana, as long as you're over the age of 21, they too have a public accommodation statute. They have a civil rights statute. And they expressly carved out in their same-sex marriage bill that no religious organization could be held liable, could be held accountable for a civil claim, a cause accommodations law. The state of Washington even has that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I submit that the language in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, looks nothing like the other states that have passed same-sex marriage. And yet we talk about modeling our exemption after Connecticut. This language does not, is not modeled after Connecticut. Connecticut does include an exemption for accommodations. So again, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, respectfully, I offer this friendly floor amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Representative. Uh, Speaker, before we go on to you, uh, I am going to call on those for insertion. Do you want to insert something in them? You know, yes, or you Mr. Wish to speak? Speaker. Um, I wish for permission to have the words of the representative from Kapolei to be inserted in the journal as my own, and also so if I may have permission to insert my own comments. So ordered. Thank you. Representative Psyche. Mr. Speaker, I call for the question. So, you have a second. Second. It has been moved and seconded to call for the question. Before we go and call for the question, we'll, you'll have an opportunity for insertion of comments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On my left, uh, before we get into that, I'm going from the left to the middle to the right, if you don't mind. On the left, anyone to want to insert comment? Representative Hart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I request permission to enter additional written comments into the journal? So ordered. Thank you. Rep and Representative Tokyoka. With reservations and written comments. Thank you. So ordered. Because of the underlying bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So ordered, Representative. Anyone else on my left? In the middle, anyone? wish to speak. Uh, Representative Awana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, in support. Written comments requesting the words of the good representative from Kapolei to be entered into the journal as if they were my own, and also ask for, um, permission to uh, include additional comments. Thank you, so Mr. Order. Speaker. Representative Marcus Oshiro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May the record reflect the uh, words of the representative from Kapolei as my own, also permission to sit insert written comments. So ordered, Representative. Thank you. Anyone else in the middle wish to insert comment? On my right, anyone else? Representative Ward. Mr. Speaker. Representative Ward. Speaker, uh, written comments, permission, as well as copying the comments from the representative of So ordered. Yeah. And speaker say? In support with the words of the representative from Kapolei as though they were my own. So ordered. Thank representative. you. Representative uh, Fali. Uh, Mr. Speaker, same request. So ordered. And Representative Woolley. Written comments in opposition. So ordered. Anyone else on my right to have written comments inserted? If not, then we're going to be calling for the, the motion to cease debate. All those in favor to cease debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Are those opposed? Okay, you just made it. Uh, debate is ceased. And now, and uh, we're going to number 29 now, Amendment 29. All those in favor of Amendment number 29 signify by saying aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. So the amendment fails. And Members, uh, we're going now to the main motion, but I'm going to take a short break. You let you rest a little bit until we come back. A five, five minute break.
Order will the House come to order, please? All right, members, we're on third reading on Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. <laughs> Representative Rhodes. Mr. Speaker. Please proceed. Uh, uh, we are now to the uh, main motion, and uh, we're, at, we're at the main motion. We're on item five, Senate Bill One, House Draft One. Uh, as I as we discussed, I think it was two days ago. Uh, because the floor amendments all failed, this is the same bill that we were looking at two days ago, um, and uh, the amendments from the Senate were that we expanded the religious exemption. We took out the the uh, language on uh, parentage. We changed the effective date to a little later because the, for, the uh, special session has gone longer than we anticipated, and there were some technical and uh, conforming amendments. Okay, thank you very, thank you much. very much. Can I call on the, uh, the finance chair? Thank you. Mr. Representative Luke. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak in favor of this bill. This bill, Mr. Speaker, represents more than allowing marriage for same-sex couples. This is about a move towards acceptance, tolerance, and compassion. Many today have already addressed the substance of this bill and many will continue to do so. So rather, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the many individuals who helped behind the scenes during this special session. We often talk about the record number of days and participants involved in this special session. However, if we had spent 55 hours, our staff probably spent about 100 hours. There's been some, also some talk about the cost of the special session, but our staff didn't get overtime or comp time, working long hours and weekends as well. The staff of the house has supported us and each other in perhaps the most exemplary display of teamwork you will ever find. First of all, my deepest gratitude goes out to the Sergeant at Arms, Kevin Kuroda and Deputy Lon Peresa. And along with everybody in the Sergeant at Arms office. Also, major thanks to Lieutenant Darrow Na'a'au and Sergeant Reed Ogata. The State Sheriff Robin Nagamine and Deputy Director Sean Suha and their sheriff for an amazing job in keeping everyone safe. Special thanks to House Chief Clerk Brian Takeshita, Assistant Rupert Juarez and their staff who are responsible for processing the thousands of testimony and they made our jobs easier. Big mahalos to them for processing all the testimony and working behind the scenes and making sure that our computers were working and making it very easy for us to follow the testimony. A special thanks to Janice Higaki from Chief Clerk's Office along with a group of volunteers from our, from our various house offices who operated with grace and efficiencies, taking whatever questions or complaints the public or the members had. In addition, the House Majority Staff Office and its leaders, Joan Yamaguchi, Richard Devanch, James Funaki, Rebecca Anderson, and Jamie Go, were instrumental in supporting the Sergeant at Arms on the floor, as well as answering and fielding many of the calls. They also volunteered at the hearing. Similarly, mahalo to the minority staff for their efforts as well. Chair Rhodes, it's been a pleasure working with you and Jessica Page, Page, sorry, on the final draft of the bill. Thank you also to Sunny Lee, who has really put a solid plan together. And for the last few days, I guess for the last two weeks, it's been very challenging, but thanks to your staff for making it very smooth. Without you and your staff, this wouldn't have been possible. And thank you to the Senate for their countless hours in giving us guidance for making this a smooth process. I would also like to 
of course, thank the Finance Committee members, Judiciary Committee members, and other uh, members who came out to test, uh, listen to the testimony. It was because of your participation that we are here today. There were so many people who helped run the hearings and making it smooth. And with your indulgence, I think it's deserving after all these hours of um, debate that I personally acknowledge, acknowledge every single one of them because I think they were the ones who stood behind, watched, and made sure that things went well. So with your indulgence, I would like to name every one of them, if, you, if I may. Sunny Lee, Representative Rhodes Office. Randall Hioto, Finance Committee. Susan Fernandez, Finance Committee. Stacey Tagala, Finance Committee. Julie Yang, from my office. Carol Kaapu, Representative Johansson's office. Kevin Wong, Representative Nishimoto's office. Randy Yamamoto, Representative Nishimoto's office. Jason Young, HMSO. Jamie Go, HMSO. John Kamura, Representative Bilotti's office. Mark Merrill Rogan, Representative Morikawa's office. Tracy Weedy, Representative Onishi's office. Jonathan Tangpalan, Representative Saiki's office. Karen Kaomoto, Representative Takayama's office. Richard Silva, Representative Tokioka's office. Brian Dorser, Representative Woodson's office. Sean Nakama, LRB Deputy Director. Matthew Koch, LRB. Shannon Mears, LRB. And last but not least, Nandana Kalupahana, who was instrumental in ensuring that the hearings ran smoothly. And as you can see, you know, the various representatives, um, the various staffers that work for these representatives voted on differently on this issue, but it was actually the staff who set that all aside to make sure that it was fine. On a final note, special thanks to the chief clerk's office and Joe Hamasaki for making sure that we had sustenance. Mr. Speaker, I probably missed uh, many others, and if I could ask that rest of the names be submitted into the journal and additional remarks be submitted into the journal. All right, thank, thank you very much, Representative. Thank you very much for the discussion. Can I have Representative, uh, the Minority Leader, please? You wish to, you wish to speak? I give you due deference to your, your position. I'm sorry, Speaker. Can I have a quick recess? Recess. Representative McDermott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I rise in opposition to this measure. Please uh, proceed. I want to thank the two chairs. I think they did a much better job than our counterparts. They did let everyone testify who showed up, and I appreciate that, Mr. Speaker. And this has been a long and grueling process, and I am about out of gas. Running on coffee right now, four hours sleep, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, I oppose this measure for a myriad of reasons, but the least of which I believe it's unconstitutional. Let me explain. Mr. Speaker, in 1998, we told the voters the state of Hawaii, through the Office of Elections, publicly funded informational documents that, and I quote verbatim, a yes vote would add a new provision to the Constitution that would give the legislature the power to reserve marriage to opposite sex couples only. Now the, the emphasis added, of course, was my own there, but that's the verbatim language. The two key words to me, Mr. Speaker, are reserve and only. Reserve means to keep, to hold, to secure, to set aside. When I make a car reservation, they're supposed to hold it for me. Only means alone, 
in a kind of class, standing alone by reason of superiority, and finally, it means, and nothing else more. Now, those are the words, Mr. Speaker, that we sent out to every registered voter in 1998. Those are the words that the state funded. The state has a responsibility to those voters. We're going to hear talk about justice, and fairness, and equity. What about the justice and fairness and equity for the voters who cast their ballot based on this informational document that the Office of Elections sent out to every registered voter? And they also advertised in the daily papers every week for a month. Well, I think the daily paper has forgotten that, but nevertheless, it is true, Mr. Speaker. A yes vote would add a new provision to the Constitution that would give the legislature the power to reserve marriage to opposite sex couples. Mr. Speaker, that's plain language, and I'm a plain man. I can look at that all day, every day, and twice on Sundays, and I do not see how that gives us the authority to pass a same-sex marriage statute. In fact, whatever authority we had on marriage, this supersedes it. You see, Mr. Speaker, there'll be talk about legislative intent and committee reports, but all that is dwarfed by the power of the people who we derive our power from when it is expressed in a constitutional amendment. A constitutional amendment is a basketball. A committee report is a pebble. I can't believe I'm the only one who sees this. We have a lot of lawyers in here, and I'm sure they will explain away the language. But again, Mr. Speaker, there is United States Supreme Court law that says the vote, the, the intent of the voters on a constitutional amendment trumps any statutory language, trumps any committee reports, trumps all this stuff. Now, Mr. Speaker, We'll get our day to argue that next week. But it's not the first time I brought it up. What about the fairness and equity for the voters who cast their ballot in 1998? We are telling them that somehow this meant same-sex marriage. It did not. And I will close with an honest man's pillow is his peace of mind. Thank you. All right, Representative, Mr. Speaker. thank you very much. Uh, further discussion? Uh, Speaker. Representative uh, Mark Takai. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Request a ruling on a potential conflict of interest. State your ruling. According to Department of Defense Directive 134410, use of military ranks, job titles, and photographs in uniform do not express or imply endorsement by the Hawaii Army National Guard, the Department of the Army, or the Department of Defense. I am, Mr. Speaker, a member of the Hawaii Army National Guard. No conflict, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Please Request proceed. also permission to insert other written comments in, in support. So ordered. Thank you. Request your permission, Mr. Speaker, to insert a memorandum from Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, dated August 13, 2013, subject, Extending Benefits to Same-Sex Spouses of Military Members, Mr. Speaker. Order. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Speaker, request permission to insert a memorandum from the Under Secretary of Defense, Jessica Wright, dated August 13, 2013, subject further guidance on extending benefits to same sex spouses of military members. Order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this measure. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to first acknowledge the thousands of people who have contacted our office both in favor and against this bill. People have visited our offices, some have written or called, and many have emailed. As of last night, approximately 73 
hundred have contacted our office in support and 6,200 have contacted our office opposed. I thank everyone who has contacted me and I thank them all for participating in the legislative process. And although I couldn't respond to every single person who contacted me, I hope that my words today help them understand my thoughts and my decision on this bill. My first day on the job was November 8, 1994, exactly 19 years ago today. I mention this, Mr. Speaker, because like today, this issue was front and center in 1994. Many of the concerns raised by opponents are the same as the 1990s. But times change, Mr. Speaker. Times change, people change, and I've changed. In a year, I will be a former member of this House. I have chosen to leave after 20 great years. Some people have accused me of voting in support of this bill because of my desires to be the next congressman from Hawaii. Nothing can be further from the truth. I am voting yes because it is the right thing to do. Since the ruling earlier this summer by the U.S. Supreme Court on Article 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, this issue has had widespread attention in Hawaii and throughout the nation. I have served alongside gays and lesbians as a member of the Hawaii National Guard. The service, the service members who I have worked with during my 14 years in the National Guard have underscored the importance of treating everyone fairly. Our LGBT veterans love this country as much as I do. They fought and some have died. When I was deployed to the Middle East in 2009, the military our military family took care of my family, my wife and our two kids. Deployments are stressful, and couples in the military, no matter if they are straight or gay, need this support. I'm pleased with the leadership taken by Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Secretary Hagel states, it is now the department's policy to treat all married military personnel equally. The department will work to make the same benefits available to all military spouses, regardless of whether they are in same-sex or opposite-sex marriages." Unquote. Legal federal benefits are being provided to same-sex military families in Hawaii now. This bill will provide the same benefits to our local same-sex families as our military same-sex families are already receiving. My yes vote for this bill is a vote for love, equality, and fairness. Actually, Mr. Speaker, the truth is there have been very hurtful words said about me by some of those who I have respected. Some have questioned my motives. Some have threatened to abandon me. I've had numerous church bulletins singling me out. I've had not one, but two brochures mailed to our community from First Assembly of God and New Hope Leeward. But despite these hateful and negative tactics, I'm at peace. I made my final decision on this bill after speaking with my wife, Sammy, who thanked me for this vote. She thanked me, Mr. Speaker. In my 19 years in this house, my wife hasn't said a word about any of my previous votes. But for this vote, definitely one of the most challenging. This mo vote means a lot to her, and it means a lot to me. I'm at peace, and I'm in a good place, Mr. Speaker, because I know my yes vote today is righteous and pono. This is my chance to make the correct choice and to do the right thing. I will not have another chance here on this floor to vote yes. And 20 years from now, I want to look back on my legislative career with no regrets. There are many who say that opposing this bill, they are opposing this bill because of their religion. They cite the separation of church and state. Is the speaker? Yes, I yield my time. So order. Thank you, Representative. However, there are many religions there are many pastors, 
many Christian pastors who support this bill. I support this bill because of the separation of church and state. If you and your church do not support marriage equality, then you are not forced to marry same-sex couples. You will not be forced to have gay weddings in your church. But this bill gives the churches that embraces all couples, no matter if their gender persuasion, gay, lesbian, or straight, this bill gives these loving, committed couples the right to marry in churches that welcome them. We can't, why can't couples who care so much for each other have the same wonderful marriage that we have, Mr. Speaker? Why can't churches that love these couples and that want to marry these couples do so? Why not, Mr. Speaker? The essence of our islands is captured in the Hawaii state law. The Aloha Spirit is defined by state law, and I quote, The Aloha Spirit is the coordination of mind and heart within each person. Aloha is the essence of relationships in which each person is important to every other person for collective existence, unquote. That's in state law, Mr. Speaker. I didn't make it up. In my mind and the deepest fibers of my heart, I believe that it is time that our laws reflect the Aloha Spirit. We are the Aloha State, and Aloha means love. And this bill, Mr. Speaker, is all about love. It is, this, it is my heartfelt honor and my privilege that for marriage equality in Hawaii, I vote yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Representative, for the discussion. Yes, Representative uh, Brower. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, in support. Uh, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, like so many single men who live in Waikiki, I live the lifestyle of an openly straight heterosexual male raised Roman Catholic. And as many testifiers have said at our six days of hearings, now let me say it. I have friends who are gay. I don't hate gay people. As a longtime resident of Waikiki, I've met people who are gay, quasi-gay, gaysian, bisexual, metrosexual, pansexual, heteroflexible, fa'a'afina, transgendered, androgynous, mahu, and a granny who was a tranny. And while we are tolerant of different cultures in Hawaii's melting pot, the majority must strive to be tolerant of someone who is different. And people of alternative lifestyles must be respectful of society's norm. The strongest of all human qualities is acceptance. And through acceptance, we achieve wisdom and that helps us to reach our full human and cosmic potential. Because you are a spiritual being having a human experience. And today is an opportunity for people on both sides of this issue to show the world that you have what it takes to evolve to higher standards. Personally speaking, the issue of same-sex marriage was not on my legislative priority list not on my radar or my gaydar, but similar to how a fireman must go into a burning building, a legislator must go to where the controversy is with conviction, without excuses, when called to a special session. Personal feelings should influence but not overrule a legislator's objective thoughts and behavior. That is why I listened to the testifiers on both sides of the issue on this topic. Truth, Mr. Speaker, exists on both sides. I'm supporting this bill because it's the duty of state government to help minority groups, especially when the group is asking for what many consider logical, rational, and fair. I believe that intimate monogamous relationships with people taking care of people is the backbone of a strong society. And I have such respect for marriage, I'm not sure I can achieve it because I want it to be such a soulmate connection. I notice, figuratively speaking, this bill has all the same DNA 
as Hawaii's heterosexual marriage law. All the same rights, benefits, and protections. The only point of contention is the eight-letter word marriage. Most against the bill say it is because it includes the word marriage. But it would be illogical to call the law anything else other than marriage. What are we going to name it? I can't believe it's not marriage, or marriage with an asterisk, or marriage in quotation marks, or marriage wink wink, or hashtag marriage. I'm not religious in the traditional sense. I believe I have a relationship with God and I ask for his guidance and I ask guidance from his partner, Jesus. Perhaps God does not prove of homosexuality. It's not how he intended things to be, but neither, Mr. Speaker, is a lot of what we see in today's, quote, normal heterosexual lifestyle. Spiritually, I do not feel that legalized same-sex marriage will make our state any more or less moral than it is or will be. In the eyes of God, how is same-sex marriage any different than same-sex couples living together monogamously without the marriage license? I encourage Christians to be more concerned with the actions of people who call themselves Christians than gay people calling themselves married. Isn't our faith in the institution of marriage between a man and a woman strong enough to withstand an adjustment to its definition? This bill does not redefine God or the Bible's idea of marriage. It does not mean that gay is the new straight. It only readjusts or expands the state of Hawaii's definition of marriage. And perhaps it just declares that love is the answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Fuller. Yes, Representative Woolley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support. Please proceed, Representative. Thank you. This, this process has been long and painful, but it has helped us all learn a lot about ourselves, our beliefs, and about each other. I want to thank everyone who talked to me about this issue testified, emailed, called, sang, or blessed me. I listened and I learned a lot. Throughout these deliberations, I have been guided by the oaths I took to defend and protect the constitutions of the United States of America and Hawaii. And during the challenging hearing process, I listened and read testimony and I searched for guidance from leaders past and present. In 1970, Governor John Burns allowed Hawaii's abortion statute to become law without his signature. Governor Burns said, quote, he must never let his private political and religious convictions unduly influence his judgment as governor of all the people. He continued, in the recent debates and public controversy over proposed abortion law changes in our state, I have been subjected to pleadings, warnings, even threats from many sources, including clergymen and lay members of my own Roman Catholic Church and members of other churches and non-religious groups. I have felt my reputation has been unfairly and seriously attacked and, sadly enough, by a number of my fellow Roman Catholics who do not appear to understand precisely the separate roles of state authority and church authority, end quote. I feel the same way. I will vote aye because number one, same-sex couples in Hawaii do not have the right to 1,138 federal benefits enjoyed by opposite-sex married couples. These benefits are now available because the U.S. Supreme Court determined in June that unequal treatment of married same-sex couples is unconstitutional. Number two, this bill provides for broad religious protection, leaving every church free to decide whether or not to marry same-sex couples. Far from trampling on religious freedom, the bill goes far beyond the requirements of the First Amendment, allowing religious institutions to choose who can use their facilities for weddings and receptions, even if they're in the business of making a profit. 
My decision to vote yes was ultimately determined by our nation's founding fathers who wrote the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They agreed that a government formed by the people requires that no single church dictate the actions of the state. Instead, American leaders agreed that there must be a separation between church and state with strong protections for religious freedom, a representative democracy, and a bill of rights to prevent the tyranny of the majority. Colleagues, U.S. Supreme Court cases interpreting the First and Fourteenth Amendments for nearly 50 years have laid the foundation for us to be here today to vote on this bill. In 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Loving v. Virginia that laws preventing marriages between persons on the basis of racial discrimination violated the Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses of the 14th Amendment. The court ruled that the freedom to marry has long been recognized as one of the vital personal rights essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. Quote, marriage is one of the basic civil rights of many, fundamental to our very existence and survival. Under our Constitution, the freedom to marry or not marry a person of another race resides with the individual and cannot be infringed by the state. End quote. Twenty years ago, in 1993, a lawsuit was filed against the state when it refused to grant a same-sex couple a valid marriage license. The Supreme Court ruled that, quote, no person shall be denied the equal protection of the laws nor be denied the enjoyment of the person's civil rights or be discriminated against in the exercise thereof because of race, religion, sex, or ancestry, end quote. The arguments we have been hearing on this bill are eerily similar to ones debated and litigated for over 20 years. For some people, there will never be enough discussion because they prefer the status quo. In response to the Hawaii Supreme Court decision, this legislature took up the issue Will in 1997. Will someone yield to the representative? Uh, representative? Looks like everybody want to get their full time. Yes, no, I'll, Representative I'll yield, Evans. I'll yield three minutes. Representative Evans will yield three minutes. Thank okay. you, Representative. Please proceed. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. House Bill 117, introduced in 1997 by you, Mr. Speaker, in its final form, your bill said, quote, the legislature further finds that the question of whether or not the state should issue marriage license to couples of the same sex is a fundamental policy issue to be decided by the elected representatives of the people, end quote. That is why we are here today. A mere five months ago, on June 26, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in U.S. v. Windsor that Section 3 of DOMA was unconstitutional. The court found that the avowed purpose and practical effect of the law was to make same-sex marriages second-class marriages. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Kennedy stated, quote, DOMA's principal effect is to identify a subset of state-sanctioned marriages and make them unequal. The principal purpose is to impose inequality differentiation demeans the couple whose moral and sexual choices the Constitution protects and whose relationship the state has sought to dignify. And it humiliates tens of thousands of children now being raised by same-sex couples." End quote. As a result, several federal agencies are changing their policy, policies to comport with the Supreme Court ruling. For example, on August 9th, the Social Security Administration, Acting Commissioner, Carol Colvin said, quote, I am pleased to announce that Social Security is now processing some retirement spouse claims for same-sex couples and paying benefits when they are due. The recent Supreme Court decision helps ensure that all Americans are treated fairly and equally with the dignity and respect they deserve, end quote. I also looked for wisdom from Hawaiian leaders, and I really want to thank Kuhio Lewis, Chair for the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. In urging us to support SB1, he said, quote, it is time for Hawaiians who have been silent for so long on this issue to raise our voices against the parasitic capitalization of our culture, history, language, and philosophy by those who continue to convolute and decimate us 
even beyond what has already been accomplished at the hands of the colonizers. Kanaka Maoli have been conditioned for so long to think and act like foreigners that we have allowed the meaning and intent of our words, traditions, and philosophies to be replaced by neo-Christian beliefs and used to further a Western political agenda on our islands." End quote. Mr. Speaker, it's critical to approach this issue with love and not hate. We should love all people, regardless of their religious views or their sexuality. Now is the time for us to heal as this discussion continues to move forward. And I want to just read a couple um, passages from a book that the woman I mentioned earlier from La Ie, uh, who is Mormon, has shared with me um, to help guide me in making my decision. The Lord uses the unlikely to accomplish the impossible. Try to speak your soul, heal your heart, unclutter your mind, lift your spirit, strengthen your resolve, energize, and invigorate you. Okay. Shut in at arms, will you? Please. Ten seconds. Yeah. Ten seconds. We need to seek truth. We need to speak truths to ourselves and others. We need to remember what we know to be true. We need to share what we know to be true with those we love. Let the truths you know and love connect you with the people you know and love. And with that, I would also like to ask to insert written comments in support. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much for the discussion. Mr. Yes, Speaker? Representative uh, uh, Matsu Matsumoto. Matsumoto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Please proceed. Please, uh, please proceed. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I stand in opposition to Ho Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. My vote in opposition is not because I don't believe in equal benefits. My vote in opposition is against this process. The other day, one of our colleagues made an insightful point, saying, and I quote, we are unable to see past our own beliefs. We believe we are right, each of us, whether we are on this side or that side. And in a sense, we have gotten to the point where almost no information, no statements can change our beliefs. I completely agree with that statement. And I would argue if we are in fact so stuck in our beliefs that we are unable to make an objective decision, then maybe the 76 members of this legislative body shouldn't be the only people voting on this monumental measure. If we can't see past our own beliefs, then perhaps the 700,000 registered voters in our state should have a say as well. And Mr. Speaker, as a young legislator, I do still believe in the process. In 2012, Washington State introduced similar legislation. The Senate passed it, the House passed it, and the governor signed it. But then the citizens of Washington gathered sufficient signatures to put it on the ballot, and they voted on it, and the people passed it, 54 to 46. What's significant is all sides were able to have ownership of that decision. Ownership of that decision. So whether or not they agreed on the outcome, they had all taken part in the process. Here we can get that same opportunity. The people of Hawaii can have ownership in the decision. And so my vote, Mr. Speaker, is not in opposition to equal benefits. My vote comes in opposition to the process. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much, Representative. Representative uh, Lowen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, in support. Please proceed. First of all, thank you so much to the staff for all the hard work, to all the members of this body, and especially to the many people who took the time to call, email, submit written testimony, and come to the Capitol to give testimony in person. I do regret there's not equal opportunity for my neighbor island constituents to participate in person. 
I've led an effort to bring greater access to government to the neighbor islands, and I will continue to work towards that. Nonetheless, I have heard from my community, from hundreds of constituents, through emails, calls, social media, and more. I've heard from both those in support and in opposition to this bill. And I have tried to honor the concerns of all. With the amendments made in the House, many of which were specifically requested in testimony, this is a balanced bill and provides for both equal rights for all and protects the First Amendment rights of religious organizations at the same time. There are a few other things I have to say. After listening to over 50 hours of testimony, I was saddened by many of the hurtful and incorrect things that were said. It was indeed difficult to sit through. So here are a few things that I think need to be said. AIDS is not a consequence of being gay. It's a virus that affects over 35 million people worldwide, with almost 70% of cases occurring in Africa. Everyone is equally susceptible to this illness. Second, there is no homosexual lifestyle, just like there is no straight lifestyle. Within the LGBT community, there is the same diversity that can be found in society at large. All cultures, all religions, all nationalities, Democrats and Republicans, soccer moms, criminals, doctors, lawyers, and carpenters. The LGBT community are just people like all of us. I do not believe that being gay is a choice. And recent scientific studies, as we heard in testimony, support this. But I don't need a molecular biologist or a geneticist or any number of Harvard degrees to convince me. I respect that if someone tells me how they feel about themselves, that they are the experts on themselves. Regarding some of the incendiary claims that were made in testimony about how marriage equality will affect our education system, it is irresponsible to perpetuate these lies. This is fear-mongering at its worst and is a grave disservice to society. Finally, throughout this process, there have been many accusations of some of us having an agenda. And to that I say, there is no hidden agenda that I know of. Rather, there is a conscientious effort to promote equality, uphold our Constitution, and work towards a society based on mutual respect that tolerates differences and values diversity. And if that is my agenda, then I am proud of it. Thank you, Speaker. And with that, uh, I would like permission to insert additional written comments into the journal. So ordered, Speaker. Speaker. Thank you very much, Ben, and Representative Ward. Speaker, I rise in opposition. Please proceed. Speaker, I'd like to make two categorical uh, comments with different points under each of those. The first is the process. The process of being here is flawed. You didn't want to come in a special session. The Senate didn't want to come in a special session. But here we are because of the governor. And the governor, I don't believe, is with us any longer. But we did not come here at our own will. In fact, the surveys indicated that 70% of the people said this issue belongs to them, not to us. And we haven't heard the last of that. Another part of the process that I think is flawed, Mr. Speaker, is I don't believe we acted in good faith in all of the great things that we're patting ourselves on the back after these uh, 55 hours. Remember that your chairs tried to shut down the hearing by going all night on Thursday night. Fortunately, you, Speaker, saved us by telling your, your chairs don't burn out the members and don't burn out the public by going against what the majority press release said that if there are people still in line by midnight Thursday night, they will be allowed to testify the next day. Thank you for, for keeping your word. But no, Mr. Speaker, we could have been shut down the first night of the hearing. Fortunately, we've gone for 55 hours. They thereafter kept their word. And I'm very grateful for that, because everybody who had a chance to speak spoke. And that is very, very good. Mr. Speaker, I won't mention some of the more superficial things, like people getting permission to go shishi. The other day, we captured them in here. We wouldn't let them out. 
uh, unless they gave a driver's license. That was undemocratic. Shutting down debate today, Mr. Speaker, was undemocratic. You, you know, the, the rush to make sure that these amendments didn't do stuff. We spent, you guys spent more time in your caucus with recess that we spent out here on debate when we were starting going. Mr. Speaker, what's, what's the value here when we've got the people of Hawaii wanting to hear what we said and they're not, they're not hearing it? Which reminds me to remind you that the 11 hours of debate, which has burned out a few of my colleagues, none of the people heard that, Mr. Speaker, because of decisions that were made, and I have no reason what, what the motivations were, that we would we did five days of television and then we went dark. Five days to hear the people and then one day they didn't hear their representatives. They didn't hear their representatives. Mr. Speaker, that was not, that was not fair. That was uh, as bad as some of the House rules that you pulled out today and shut uh, the debate down. Okay, that's enough about the process. Let's go to the bill. I put in three amendments because, well, number one, the, the churches are vicariously protected. They have a shield around them, but not with really inability to be pierced. That's why the amendment was, and as the good Representative of Coppola said, we need to make sure it's very clear about this public accommodations. Because given what the Attorney General said and the Civil Rights Commission, the penetration of that in lawsuits are going to be numerous. And Mr. Speaker, another part of the lawsuits is where a TRO was filed against some of the church leaders, Wayne Cadero, Elwin Ahu, because of the people who are out here. So if we think we've created unity between the communities, even while we're doing the democratic process, a TRO was filed to shut down the people who are out there probably singing and, and, uh, and shouting. Mr. Speaker, that's not, that's not good. The second part of the, the problem with the bill is the protection for those who are small businesses the protection of those who have conscience, the protection of those who want to do commerce at the same time remain true to their beliefs. This bill is entirely devoid of any of that. Thirdly, and I'm going to go back to the mama bear syndrome, the women of Hawaii, the mothers of Hawaii have said, leave our keiki alone, leave our keiki out of this. And Mr. Speaker, I gave you a touch of the Pono curriculum that I showed that there were slight sentiments that were leading towards teaching of the homosexual lifestyle in our curriculum now, even before same-sex marriage is passed. Subsequent to that, Mr. Speaker, there is even more indications that same-sex, what's the best word to say? The same-sex activities and how they are done are already in the curriculum in some places and are going to be obviously uh, discussed in the in the coming days. So, Mr. Speaker, these things about uh, fearing that this, uh, I think one of my colleagues said uh, very derogatorily, perpetuating lies. Mr. Speaker, we don't have to go to Massachusetts. We don't have to go to Canada. We don't have to go to the moon to prove it's there. The curriculum revolution follows same-sex marriage. That's a corollary. That's the reality of it. Mr. Speaker, the point is we keep our eyes open to what is about to happen. My fear is the conflict between the two communities is going to be resolved in the courts. Mr. Speaker, his time is up. We are not here to make money for the lawyers. Mr. Speaker, his time is up. My time is up, and I thank you for the gratuitous remarks to make sure that I say lastly, Mr. Speaker, let the people decide, because if they don't, they're going to decide who's here. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Lee and then Onishi. Okay? Thank you. Can I ask to insert written comments in support? Sure. No, Mr. Speaker, it has been 20 years since Hawaii's Supreme Court ruled that denying marriage to same-sex couples violated our Constitution. For those families, it has been 20 years fighting discrimination to earn the same respect as everyone else. Testifying here the other day was a family of two women and their 16-year-old daughter. I asked them, how could they live in a community that rejects them and sit through five days of people testifying loudly and repeatedly that they aren't a real family, that their love isn't real, that they are evil, that they're an abomination and they have no place here in Hawaii? They said for them that hearing was horrific, but we endured because we love our daughter and our daughter loves us. And we still have hope that one day she will grow up in a Hawaii that is better than this. 
where she won't face discrimination because her family is different than others. Mr. Speaker, this bill is our chance to fulfill that dream of a better future and help end an era of discrimination that is hurting countless families here in Hawaii. Make no mistake, this is a hard issue, but we are elected to make hard decisions and do the right thing knowing that we're not gonna make everybody happy and not everyone will approve. When interracial marriage was legalized, just 20% of the public approved of such relationships, 20%. But I wonder how people back then explained to their grandchildren today that opposing interracial marriage was the right thing to do. What we do here today is not game changing. It is not precedent setting, it is not extraordinary. It is but one page in the greatest tradition in American history, the sacred obligation of each succeeding generation to extend basic rights, liberties, and freedom to those previously denied them, and live up to the promise of freedom and equality this ma nation made at its inception. When women's suffrage, racial equality, and interracial marriage are now commonplace, but each was seen as unacceptable, controversial, and even immoral in recent history. These social evolutions were not easy, and it is unfortunate that the great march toward justice and equality often divides before it unites, but pursuing freedom for all has been the right thing to do every time, and our society is healed, and together we have grown stronger. It's time we move forward once more. Attitudes are changing, and I know the day will soon come when same-sex families are seen as equals, because people aren't born discriminating against them, people are taught to discriminate against them. And those lessons are slowly disappearing with each passing generation as more people begin to recognize that they have sons and daughters, friends and neighbors who are gay, but who are regular people with hopes and dreams and who have families just like us. The truth, Mr. Speaker, is that the rest of us have little to fear because same-sex families have always lived in our society and will continue to live here whether we pass this bill or not. They will continue to have relationships whether we pass this bill or not, and they will continue to raise children whether we pass this bill or not. But here we have a sacred obligation to see that everyone is treated equally and fairly under the laws of this great state where it is self-evident that we are all created equal, endowed by our creator with the unalienable right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And I don't know anyone, anyone, who can find happiness while being discriminated against because of the person they love. I believe we are bound by the oaths we took to uphold the spirit of our Constitution, to pass this bill to ensure equality for all, but even if we were not, and I did not know how I was going to vote as an elected leader, I choose to err on the side of fairness. As the voice of the people, I choose to err on the side of freedom. And as a son of these islands, I choose to err on the side of aloha. And as a human, as a human being, I choose to err on the side of love. I want my children to grow up in a place where they will be treated the same as everyone else, whether they look Japanese or Hawaiian, whether they are straight or gay. Who they fall in love with and marry should be up to them and no one else. We can no longer allow the rights of one minority to be ignored. We should know better. In Hawaii, we are all minorities, and we all deserve the same dignity and respect. Mr. Speaker, someday I am going to be the one answering to my grandchildren. And when they ask, I want to tell them that I did the right thing. I vote yes. Thank you very much. Representative Mr. Speaker. Onishi. Representative o Onishi and then Takumi. I'm very sorry. You'll be right after Takumi. Okay. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too would like to thank everyone who have participated in this process on this issue. This was a serious issue and I thank my colleagues for the respect they gave to those that participated in this, uh, that participated from the public. Mr. Speaker, being from Hawaii Island and representing a district that stretches from South Hilo to Honoapu in Kau, a district of over 50 miles long, it is very difficult for my constituents to communicate with me in person. 
but they have found other ways to express their thoughts via telephone calls and messages, through emails and personal letters. I have met with individuals, leaders and representatives of organizations on both sides of the issue on this bill, on Hawaii Island and here at the Capitol. I have received hundreds and probably thousands of contacts from individuals and representatives of organizations from my district and Hawaii Island over the last five months from when this discussion began on whether or not to hold a special session to today over Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. I believe clearly that the constituents of my district have been innovative and capable of communicating with me during this special session as they have been able to do during our regular session. Mr. Speaker, I've been able to, to hear their concerns and I've also been able to share my thoughts as well. I have shared that for me, this issue is for equality. During my childhood, my focus was all about me and my needs. But as the oldest child, great responsibility and accountability was placed upon me without me asking, uh, without asking me. To take care and ensure that my younger sister, brothers, cousins, and our friends were safe, behaved, and were protected by me. I accepted that responsibility and accountability, although I didn't feel that it was fair to me. Because that was the way things were done for centuries in my Japanese culture. Was that fair? With that experience, I didn't put that responsibility on my oldest daughter over her sisters. It was my responsibility to treat each of them equally. That was an action of equality. Mr. Speaker, as an adult, I was very active in the JCs, as I know you have been. When I joined the JCs, it was only for men, no women allowed. When we were challenged in the 90s for not allowing and accepting women to join our organization, I supported the decision to change decades of past practice and allow and accept women into the JCs. That was an action of equality. Mr. Speaker, when I joined the County of Hawaii as an employee, I got involved with my union, the Hawaii Government Employees Association. I became a leader on Hawaii Island and later at the state level as a director and eventually as president of the HGA. During my involvement, we faced many issues of inequality and unequal treatment of government employees, and we fought back to correct those inequities in the workplace, the practices within departments and agencies, promotion and hiring practices, and many, many more issues. We fought for equal pay, for equal work, and the protection of benefits promised to current workers and especially our retired government workers. That were actions of equality. Mr. Speaker, taking into account all of the input that I and we have received and reviewed on the merits of this issue, today I stand in support of equality. Equality for the rights and benefits for same-sex couples that want the right to marry. And I also stand in support for protections of religious organizations their associated organizations, their facilities, and all of their clergy staff and volunteers. I believe these are the issues that have risen, sorry, to the top. And Mr. we Speaker, have I yield my time. And we have received input, discussion, yeah. and debate over Senate, uh, Senate Draft 1, HD 1, and it accomplishes both. To accomplish this, we must pass this now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. Yes, Representative Takumi. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In support, 
Please proceed. Uh, first off, I'd like to have written remarks into to the journal, if possible. So ordered. You know, Mr. Speaker, I wasn't going to say anything. I didn't speak on second reading. And in fact, when the civil unions bill passed a few years ago, I only entered written remarks because I always felt at this point everything that has to be said has been said. But as I was sitting on the floor today, it hit me that there are only six members that served in this chamber, including yourself, Mr. Speaker, that were here in 1993 when the Bear v. Lewin decision was rendered. And so with your indulgence, I'd just like to share a personal perspective and bring this full circle for me. You know, as I listened to the testimonies and read the emails that came in, I was reminded how similar this issue is to another one in our nation's history. The representative from House District 48 has alluded to it. And begging your indulgence, I'd like to draw the comparisons between that case and the measure before us today. But in order to do so, Mr. Speaker, it's critically important to remember how America was in the 1950s. Jim Crow laws, schools, restaurants, restrooms, and even drinking fountains were segregated. And all of this was legal because of the Plessy v. Ferguson case in 1896 that the Supreme Court said separate but equal was not discriminatory. But Mr. Speaker, we now know that America at that time was not a society built upon a separate but equal principle, but a society built upon a separate but unequal reality. As all this was happening in the small town of Central Point, Virginia, little did an 18-year-old black woman and a 23-year-old white man knew that they were about to make history. Why? Because Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving committed a crime under the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia. You see, Mr. Speaker, they committed the crime of falling in love and getting married. Interracial marriage was illegal in Virginia in almost half the states in the country. So in June of 1958, the couple drove to Washington, D.C., got married, and returned home. Mr. Speaker, this is no different than some of the comments I hear that why don't gays go to another state and get married and come back to this state? A few weeks after returning to Virginia, and based on an anonymous tip, the police raided their home early in the morning, hoping to catch them having sex, which was illegal in Virginia. They were rousted from their bed, handcuffed, and taken to jail. On January 6, 1959, the Lovings pled guilty and were sentenced to one year in prison. But the judge suspended the sentence for 25 years on the condition that they don't return to Virginia for those 25 years. And so they moved to the District of Columbia. You know, Mr. Speaker, in rendering the verdict, Judge Leon Bazell said, and I quote, Almighty God created the races, and he placed them on separate continents. And but for the interference with his arrangement, there will be no cause for such marriages. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix, unquote. You know, surely the judge was merely echoing the sentiments of his time that had the sincere religious belief that God did not intend for races to intermarry. Now, over 50 years later, I would hope that most of us will say that their belief at that time, however sincere, was simply wrong. A Gallup poll taken in 1958 asked, do you approve or disapprove of marriages between white and colored people, that was a term. Only 4% of the American people approved. Obviously, if we had let the people vote in 1958 whether or not interracial marriage should be legal, 96% of the American people would have voted no because they thought such marriages were not normal and the children of such marriages would suffer greatly. In subsequent Gallup polls, Mr. Speaker, it was only until 1983 that more Americans approved than disapproved of interracial marriage. In other words, the Lovings would have had to wait 25 years before public and popular opinion gave them the right to get married. The case went through the judicial system, and on June 12, 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that Virginia's law was unconstitutional. And with that decision, laws against interracial marriage that still existed in 16 states was also deemed unconstitutional. You know, in reading the history of this case, what struck me was Richard Loving's reason for initiating the lawsuit. 
Mr. and Mrs. Loving were simple people. He was a construction worker by trade. They were not rabble rousers. They were not militants. They were not activists. When asked what he wanted the Supreme Court justices to know, he replied, tell the court I love my wife and it's just unfair that I can't do with her in Virginia. Mr. Speaker, I yield my time. Fair order. Now I know some will say that this was about marriage between a man and a woman, and the measure before us today is different. Perhaps. But I will assert that the same concerns that were raised in the Loving case are being raised today. Let me conclude with a personal story, Mr. Speaker. A story not about constitutional amendments, First Amendment rights, immunity from liability, and all the rest of the nuances and subtleties that we've been discussing for the past few weeks. Some of you may know that we are blessed with five grandchildren in our family. One of them, Kayla, is a fourth grader at Momilani Elementary School. Yesterday morning, I took her to school. And as she was getting ready, she asked if I voted yes on the bill. I was surprised she asked me this because like most nine-year-olds, nine she usually asks me about going to Chuck E. Cheese <laughs> and not about contentious social issues. I told her that I did vote yes, and she said she heard the vote was 30 to 18 in favor of the bill. I asked her how she knew this, and she said she heard it on the news. So, you know, Mrs. Speaker, as the chair of your education committee, as I was driving her to school, I thought to myself, well, maybe this is a teachable moment, the kind of moments that you wait for that you can talk to your children and your grandchildren, and perhaps they can learn something. And little did I know, Mrs. Speaker, that I would be the student and Kayla the teacher. I asked her if she thought it was okay if gays got married. And she replied, if they love each other. I said, really? And she looked at me and said, Grandpa, love is love. Love is love. It's pretty simple. Kayla gets it, Mr. Speaker. It's time that we get it too. And there's no better time than today, no better time than now. I vote yes. Thank you very much, uh, Representative. Yes, Representative uh, Justin Woodson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very brief comments, if I may, uh, in opposition, respectfully. Please proceed. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you again. Um, of course, we should afford equal rights to everyone, Mr. Speaker, within reason. That, I think, goes without saying. But, Speaker, we should not be in the business of legisl legislating any religious document to do so. For there are ways in which we can go about pertaining the goals of this bill without being so divisive. Mr. Speaker, it has been said that some of us, some of us legislators have said harmful things about the homosexual community. And I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, that that assertion is inaccurate at least as far as public record goes. For to do so, Mr. Speakful, is harmful. It cuts off thought processes. It divides us. It does not bring us together. Mr. Speaker, Speaker if a bill potentially induces a flood of litigation, then it is divisive. It just does not bring us together. If a bill puts one side against another, Speaker, it's divisive. It does not bring us together. So here we are, Mr. Speaker, in the second week, practicing democracy in all of its messy glory and splendor. But this end product, Mr. Speaker, divides us. It does not bring us together. It does not bring a consensus of the majority on both sides of this issue. And for that reason, Mr. Speaker and others, respectfully, I am voting no to this measure. Thank you. All right, Representative, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Thielen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm rising in support of the bill. Please proceed. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the majority of the members in this body for allowing me to continue to serve on the Judici Judiciary Committee. I thank you very much for that. I listened to the 57 hours of testimony. I've read and responded to thousands of emails on both sides of the issue. And I want to quote from one email from a young person. And I quote, I just did something spontaneous. So I was on the bus on my way home when we passed the state capitol, which was bombarded by picketers of the marriage bill. I was shocked. It made me sad to see how many people are against equal rights. I honestly don't get it. It bothered me so much, I actually got off the bus, called my mom to tell her what was going on, and walked all the way back to the state capitol, three bus stops back. There was no question in my mind that I had to go and support my cause for equality. I walked through the crowds of traditional marriage supporters and looked for my same-sex people. It took a while, but finally I spotted a little rainbow and followed it. At the end of the rainbow, I met a woman with a sign that read, Love is Love. And I found out that the rainbow I was chasing was a lightsaber that belonged to her young son. I tapped her on the shoulder and asked if she was on the other side, and she said yes. I smiled, and I said, I'm sorry, I have to give you a hug. I thought it was very brave of her to be taking a stand among all these people who were fighting to keep her from sharing the same rights they've had since the beginning of time. Seeing her little boy made me think about my mom and all she's had to go through because of her orientation and that I've had to go through being a child of a gay parent. I've had people in person say all kinds of stuff to me about this subject. You're going to hell. Your mom's going to hell. So growing up and seeing that kind of hatred was not easy, but it taught me something. It taught me that I don't want to be hateful. Having been raised by a gay mom, I've learned to be a more loving and accepting person. And then, Mr. Speaker, this young person concludes, change needed to happen. Let's face it, times have changed. You're denying marriage equality for same-sex couples is denying the rights of love. And you never know who you're affecting. Perhaps the closest person to you is gay, but they just haven't told you yet. They could be your child, your sibling, your parent, your best friend. Do you really want to deny them their rights, deny them their happiness? Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't. And so I'm standing in support of Senate Bill 1. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, Representative. Yes, Representative Kawakami. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand in support. Please proceed. Mr. Speaker, we have engaged in a debate of what seems at the surface a myriad of topics in dealing with the definition of marriage. Who does it belong to? And at the base, the debate has brought about two sides of our community. One that holds deeply that marriage is the ultimate expression of love between one man and one woman. And on the other side is the belief that it is a civil marriage, one that has equal rights for people to have the same benefits as every married couple in our state and nation. But both, Speaker, are really about love. Love is what this is all about. And the foundation of my support for this bill has and always been about freedom. The ability to recognize that marriage is a legal relationship and the religious relationship. And under the First Amendment, we must protect these freedoms so that one religious belief is not imposed on another's. We here are tasked with balancing all of this, fully recognizing that there are many different religions, and even amongst some of these, there are varying degrees of tolerance that may not be accepted by all. But nonetheless, must recognize the vast diversity of different religious beliefs 
whereas tolerance is limited to execute the protection of freedom for any individual in our country. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to go back and recite some words that I offered this body during my invocation when I was appointed to the House. You see, Mr. Speaker, my mom taught me five things that I try to live by every day. And of course, I'm not always successful, but it serves as a part of my moral compass that disguises my decision making. The first thing she taught me was to always say thank you. So I want to thank everybody for being a part of this process. The second thing she taught me was to never judge, that only God could judge. Number three was to always forgive. This is often the hardest thing to do, but holding in animosity is like slowly poisoning yourself. Four was to always leave a place or person in a better state than what you found them in. And fifth, and most importantly to me, is that there is only one time when it's okay to look down on somebody. There's only one time when it's okay to look down on somebody, and it's when you're standing over them picking them up off the ground after they've fallen. Mr. Speaker, now after today, now more than ever, we're going to have to work hard and start picking people off the ground. A lot of people on both sides of this issue have been hurt. And our task as a community is to start the healing process. And I truly believe that through tough times, it can spur the beginning of healing. Mr. Speaker, when Kauai went through Hurricane Iniki, our island was devastated. But what was revealed was not the destruction. It was the creation of a bond between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies, families all coming together to fix things, to rebuild, to heal. And through adversity, unity was born. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Kawakami, Representative Kaufman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in strong support. Please proceed. Thank you. First, I would like to thank Governor Neil Abercrombie for calling this special session. Our governor understands and recognizes the importance of religious freedoms and the importance of equality under the law. The governor also recognized that a special session would allow us to focus on a very important subject, that if processed during regular session, would be very disruptive to thousands of bills that require our full attention beginning in January. Mr. Speaker, regarding process, the House Committee took the time to listen and process this piece of legislation. And rarely do I have the time to focus on and study a piece of legislation months in advance of a hearing. Rarely do I have the time to write the governor and the House leadership about my concerns regarding this legislation. Rarely do I have the time to meet with the Judiciary Chair to discuss my concerns in detail. Mr. Speaker, I had the time to do all that. Mr. Speaker, I was elected to make decisions to the best of my ability. I do not make decisions based upon a popularity contest or who screams the loudest. I'm always faced with opposition on every piece of legislation. I will never make everyone happy. SB1 HD1 provides for marriage equality for all while ensuring that religious freedoms are granted to the many diverse belief systems embraced here in our state. Mr. Speaker, marriage equality policy in SB1 HD1 is good legislation that makes Hawaii a better place for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Representative. Yes, Representative Ng. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of Senate Bill 1 relating to equal rights. Please proceed. Thank you. A couple of days ago, I spoke to young mainstream Christians. Today, I have a broader message. In 1998, my parents voted on a constitutional amendment to reserve marriage between one woman and one man. I remember the commercials. Vote yes for traditional marriage. Our family liked that one. And vote no on the constitutional amendment. That one was bad. You see, like most nine-year-olds, morality was a very black and white concept. There's right, and then there's wrong. 
I carried a due north, due south moral compass oriented primarily on what my incredibly loving parents, hi mom, taught me. And they, along with my church, taught me that being gay was bad. But in October 1998, a few weeks before that vote, something happened that shook and recalibrated my young conscience. Matthew Shepard, a gay teenager going to college in Wyoming, was inhumanely tortured and murdered by straight classmates. A hate crime that made national news. He was tied to a fence and beat with a pistol and left to bleed to death. I remember discussing this with a friend of mine from church and my friend said, good for him. God says he is evil. But I knew in my young heart that no one deserved this kind of brutality, no one. This is where my convictions began. You see, if we want to understand this or any gay rights issue, we need to understand the LGBT experience. Many of us just can't grasp what it'll be like. Until college, like many of the testifiers here, I thought being gay was a lifestyle choice that went against nature. But when you actually hear from the LGBT community, as we on your joint committee on finance and Judd have witnessed, it is clearly not a choice. In fact, many gay people who testified last week proclaimed that as teenagers, they fought who they are and tried to force themselves straight. Many face self-loathing and torment because of this and thank God that unlike the thousands of gay teenagers that take their own lives every year, these brave people persevered and they were able to be here today in front of a less than friendly crowd to stand up like champions for equal rights for all. For those opponents who say this isn't about civil rights, I challenge you to tell that with a clear conscience to Alan Spector, who had the love of his life deported back to South America, South America because his postdoctoral research funding expired. I challenge you to tell that to Kimberly Allen, who was not allowed to see her life pa her partner in the hospital during the last hours of her life. I challenge you to tell that to Tamara Young, who had to reconsider adoption and delay forming the family she desired because of the cost without the rights and benefits of marriage. Tell that to Bart Zowo, a soldier fighting for his freedom who was called a fame, flaming homo mistake by a rank and file superior. Tell that to Jeremy Wright, who slipped into depression trying to force or pray himself straight. And I challenge you to tell that to the parents of Matthew Shepard, that the suffering and the tragic death of their own son that they experience is not sufficient to call this a civil rights issue. Tell these people hold on until the majority is ready. Tell them they must continue to suffer inequality and hate because other people are not ready to grant them full equality. Can you do that with a clear conscience? Some testifiers have spoken about this bill ushering in an onslaught of gay lifestyle. And they challenged your committee members, Mr. Speaker, would you wish homosexuality upon your own kids? So I really thought about this. If the gay lifestyle they speak of pertains to the highly successful physicians, attorneys, economists, a world-renowned microbiologist and psychologist that we've seen testify, if this gay lifestyle pertains to the inspiringly committed couples who have been together for decades yet are still viewed as strangers in the eyes of their government, if this gay lifestyle that these pre if this gay lifestyle that they're referring to pertains to these brave people boldly standing in the face of hate to fight for equal rights for all, if that's what the gay agenda will bring, if that's how my gay children will be like, then hey, sign me up. I'll take three. And please, and please, don't write scripts for your kids to tell me that children need a mother and a father in order to be raised right. When my father passed away when I was a young child, and just like our junior U.S. Senator, and just like our Hawaii-born President of the United States, I come from a single parent home. Don't tell me that I and my brothers and sisters who are excelling in sports, academics, and art, that we are any lesser than your child. Mr. Speaker, I yield my time. Especially in Hawaii, where Hanai adoption is enshrined, is enshrined in tradition, where multi-generational families are valued just as much 
as our kupuna are, and where diversity is the hallmark of our Aloha spirit, we need to embrace empirical evidence stating that the nuclear family is no better off than other familial structures. Our children need to continue to learn that in Hawaii, we're all equal, no matter your sexual orientation and no matter how your family is structured. You see, I live in Kihei with one of the largest gay populations in the state and with the majority of my constituents in support. But for my colleagues who have the majority in their districts in opposition, let me leave you with this. In high school, my friends, just like most kids in high school, we use gay, the word gay, kind of as an insult, or as a great philosopher Mac Macklemore said, as synonymous with the lesser. Um, we hurled it at each other as to, to make fun of each other. And uh, one day, a gay classmate of mine, he was walking to band class, he tripped and he dropped a jar, a glass jar that was full of paper stars, they're colorful stars. And my friends started laughing at him. Now why, I felt bad. So I went over there and helped him. And that didn't make me really cool. As a matter of fact, every time we came, we, we, we rocked by that guy later on, my friends would say, hey, there goes your boyfriend. But I did it not because it was the popular thing to do but because it was the right thing to do. Standing up for this individual did not make me popular, but it was the right thing to do. Just because the numerical majority is in one place, it does not mean they are in the right place. We are in a position right now that we must lead our state to the right place. Sometimes the right thing to do goes against the popular thing to do. While I cannot take my parents' 1998 vote back, the people placed me in a position where I can help correct an injustice here in Hawaii. And I am prepared to face the consequences of my vote. I have, um, this, to me, this bill is about love and acceptance. In Hawaii, we call it aloha. Uh, one person in the audience stated that it's the wrong love. I don't agree. Again, I agree with Macklemore. It's the same love. I have one last question. How many more gay people must God create until we realize that he wants them here? How many more gay people must God create until we realize that he wants them here? Mr. Speaker, let the people decide who they marry. Thank you very much, Representative. <laughs> yes, Representative uh, Rhodes, please. Uh, since you didn't give a very, uh, very lengthy speech in the beginning, so yeah, now Mr. maybe you can uh, proceed. <laughs> Thank okay, you, Representative Mr. Speaker. Rhodes. In support. Yes, yeah, please as I, proceed. As I was thinking about what to say here near the end of the debate on legalizing same-sex marriage, I was thinking back on the civil union debate and of the many eloquent speeches that we heard back in 2010. Of all the speeches made during that debate, I've always liked the one that former Representative Bar Barbara Morimoto made best. Um, because I couldn't think of, I didn't think I could do better myself. I called her yesterday to see if she wouldn't mind if I quoted her. She called back today and graciously agreed to allow me to do so with a couple of caveats. One, uh, she wasn't talking about marriage uh, in, the, in the civil unions debate. And unfortunately, her, her life mate that she mentions in the statement passed away after she made the statement. But I still like it very much, and I'm going to read it. It's not very long. I think all of us, all Americans, believe in the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And to me, happiness is defined by a loving family and a faithful life, life partner, and I'm blessed with both. Sad is the person who has none of these. We would have a more, connect, a, a more contented populace and a better world if everyone had a large family, or at least someone. I don't believe our society, society will come crashing down if we pass this bill. It hasn't in Canada and Mexico and Spain and other jurisdictions. Nothing is dearer to me and to many of you here than our va family values. 
and, beca and because I believe we are all God's little children, for this reason I vote to enact civil unions. For this reason, I vote yes on this bill and request permission to insert additional comments. So ordered, and thank you very much. Yes, Representative Awana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Should I offend anyone during my speech, I apologize in advance. My intent, although inadvertent, is not to offend, but to simply share my point of view through the eyes of the overwhelming amount of testimony in opposition to this measure. Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, continues to be one of concern. On page 1 of the bill, it states that the federal government does not recognize civil unions and same-sex couples will not be recognized by the federal law. Why are we having this conversation at the state level? This issue should be taken up at the federal level, Mr. Speaker. We provide rights to civil union couples and those with reciprocal benefits at the state level. Civil unions and reciprocal benefits was the great compromise just a few years ago in 2011. We were told that if we provide these options, the GLBT community, they would be satisfied. Have the people of Hawaii not done enough? We gave you your civil unions. We gave you your reciprocal benefits. We don't have signs that say straight people only. We don't have signs that say GLBT to the rear of the bus. And we don't have separate water fountains for GLBT individuals. Have we not already shared our aloha spirit with you, our customs, our culture? Religious rights will be compromised, and I will go over that later. But our keiki, our children, our future, now in our public school system, it's happening in Hawaii, Mr. Speaker, as mentioned earlier. And it's happened in Canada, where the same-sex marriage is legal. It's happened in the mainland, where the same-sex marriage is legal. And now it's in our public school system as we stand here to debate this bill. It's masking itself as, quote, unquote, culturally responsive teen pregnancy and STI prevention program. And guess who created this program? Our very own University of Hawaii at Manoa Center on Disability Studies. Guess who their partners are? Alulike, Berkeley Policy Associates, Hawaii Department of Education, Planned Parenthood of Hawaii. And guess where it's currently being taught? On all major islands, throughout the state. The Department of Education did not provide testimony at the House joint hearings. They're already implementing the programs to indoctrinate our children into believing that homosexual relations are normal and healthy, and heterosexual relationships are abnormal and unhealthy. A concerned parent brought this information to our attention. He attended a parents' meeting introducing a new sex education curriculum for seventh graders being piloted at the university. He and many other parents were alarmed. It not only teaches hands-on experience on putting a condom on or something, but also teaching how to have homosexual sex, including oral and anal sex. Alluding to the fact that it may even be better than heterosexual sex because you don't have to worry about getting pregnant. The module also includes discussions about relationships and three scenarios were given. The two heterosexual scenarios were negative, while the homosexual scenario was painted to be very peaceful and positive. When the parents questioned the presenters why this curriculum promotes homosexual sex as better than heterosexual sex, the answer was, because that is how the UH wrote it. The department, uh, let me see here. Another point, Mr. Speaker, many have made claims that, that same-sex marriage is a civil right. I believe the people of Hawaii compromised with the same-sex marriage issue back in 2011 when we passed it, passed the Civil Unions Bill. Testimony during that time in order for the bill's passage claimed that the GLBT community would stop at civil unions. I did not support civil unions at that time, Mr. Speaker, because I knew this was a slippery slope, which would be a nightmare of a bill that we are looking at today in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. An article by then doctoral student in financial economics, Adam Kolininski from MIT, wrote the following, and I'll just read a few passages. The debate over whether the state ought to recognize gay marriages has thus far focused on the issues 
as one of civil rights. Such a treatment is erroneous because the state recognition of marriage is not a universal right. States regulate marriage in many ways besides denying men the right to marry men and women the right to marry women. Roughly half of all states prohibit first cousins from marrying and all prohibit marriage of closer blood relatives, even if the individuals being married are sterile. In all states, it is illegal to attempt to marry more than one group. All right, there is uh, time has left for you. It says someone want to contribute somebody. your time. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Speaker, I yield my time. Sorted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roughly half of all states prohibit first cousins from marrying and all prohibit marriage of closer blood relatives, even if the individuals being married are sterile. In all states, it is illegal to attempt to marry more than one person or even to pass off more than one person as one spouse. Some states restrict the marriage of couples of people suffering from syphilis or other venereal diseases. Homosexuals, therefore, are not the only people to be denied the right to marry the person of their choosing. I do not claim that all of these other types of couples restricted from marrying are equivalent to homosexual couples. I only bring them up to illustrate that marriage is heavily regulated and for good reason. When a state recognizes a marriage, it bestows upon the couple certain benefits which are close, costly to both the state and other individuals. Collecting a deceased spouse social security, claiming an extra tax exemption for a spouse, and having the right to be covered under a spouse's health insurance policy are just a few examples of the costly benefits associated with marriage. In a sense, a married couple receives a subsidy. Why? Because a marriage between two unrelated heterosexuals is likely to result in a family with children, and propagation of society is a compelling state interest. For this reason, states have, in varying degrees, restricted from marriage couples unlikely to produce children. And perhaps it may serve a state's interest to recognize gay marriages to make it easier for gay couples to adopt. However, there is ample evidence, if you see David Popenoy's Life Without Father, that children need both male and female parents for proper development. Unfortunately, small sample sizes for other methodological problems make it impossible to draw conclusions from studies that directly examine the effects of gay parenting. However, empirically verified common wisdom about the importance of a mother and a father in a child's development should give advocates of gay adoption pause. The differences between men and women extend beyond anatomy, so it is essential for a child to be nurtured by parents of both sexes if a child is to learn to function in a society made up of both sexes. It is wise to have a social policy that encourages family arrangements that deny children such essentials. Gays are not necessarily bad parents, nor will they necessarily make their children gay, but they cannot provide a set of parents that includes both male and female. The language in relation to accommodations can still be misinterpreted, Mr. Speaker. Few religious organizations have the fund to defend themselves in lengthy lawsuits. The passage of this bill is a lawyer's retirement plan. I can only imagine how many lawsuits will be filed against religious organizations and those of faith. It is already happening here in Hawaii. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, I believe we as legislators are bound to those that we represent. I've sent out surveys and 78% in my district are in opposition to anything relating to same-sex marriage. We all have friends and family members who are of the GLBT persuasion, myself included, and my vote as a con is a conduit for my constituents and this vote will not stop me from giving my aloha to the GLBT community the same way that I have in the past. I am appalled at how this measure has come before us the dreadful language that is being used in this bill and the divisiveness that was caused by the people behind this special session. To the GLBT community, I commit the resources of my office to find a solution. I will work tirelessly to establish equal rights for you so that you may have the respect, dignity, and acceptance you deserve. By use of an executive order or proclamation, the president may establish policy that grants federal recognition to civil unions enacted in the states that allow them and which directs executive branches to implement the directive immediately. 
Unfortunately, this fight is not at the state level, Mr. Speaker. It's at the federal level. Political parties are divided. We're divided in the chamber, and so are the people of Hawaii. I want Hawaii to be preserved as a Hawaii we have known. People save all of their life savings to come here and experience our Hawaii. They want to experience the Hawaiian people. That is what makes us special to anywhere in the world, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and members, let's not make Mr. this Speaker, huge mistake that Mr. we Speaker, cannot take time back. Is up. Let's time it's just is one, up. ten more seconds, please. Generations will have to endure and only wonder how it all came about. Should this bill pass, Mr. Speaker, as a native Hawaiian born and raised in the islands, I will feel like a stranger in my own homeland. The process and the language in this bill is not Pono. And for Wrap the future up. of Hawaii and the future of the Hawaiian kingdom that continues to lie dormant, Mr. Speaker, I vote in opposition. opposition. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Representative Mizuno, Vice Speaker Mizuno.